on my best angle. The hour of one o'clock having arrived, <laughs> we will call to order this session of the Santa Cruz City Council and the clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Newsom. Present. Brown. Here. Watkins. Here. Uh, Bruner. Present. Kalantari Johnson. Present. Vice Mayor Golder. Here. Mayor Keeley. Here. A quorum having been established, we will uh, at this point take any public comment here in council chambers or online relative to the items on our closed session. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with that, we will be going into closed litigation session uh, allowed under the law. And if you have on any of the three items that are on there, you wish to make a comment, this would be your opportunity to do so. We will then adjourn to closed session. When we finish that, we will come back into open session, take up the balance of our council agenda, including a report from council, if necessary, from our city attorney, if necessary, on any of the items we cover in closed session that are required by law to be disclosed. So let me first see if there's anyone with us in chambers today who wishes to make a comment. Seeing and hearing none, we will see if there's anyone online. There is nobody else. No one online. We are in closed session. Santa Cruz City Council is back in session following our closed session. Uh, this would be the opportunity, we're on oral communication, this would be the opportunity for anyone to address the council on a matter under our jurisdiction, but not on today's agenda. Mayor, if I could just call roll really quick. Oh, I'm sorry, excuse okay. me, thank you so much. <laughs> we'll call the roll. Council Members Newsom. Present. Brown. Here. Watkins. Here. Bruner. Present. Kalantari Johnson. Present. Vice Mayor Golder. Here. And Mayor Keeley. Here. In establishing a quorum, uh, we'll move to oral communications. If you wish to address the council on an item under our jurisdiction but not on today's agenda, feel free to do so. If you wish to address us on something on our agenda, you'll be given the opportunity to do that separately. So if there are, uh, Ms. Time Runner, come on up. Good to see you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I'm a resident of Aptos, but I do a lot of business within the city of Santa Cruz. I want to um, relay to you information about uh, a group that I have been following called Catalysts for Local Control. It is a group of city and county leaders uh, from the whole state that are meeting with local legislators to try to address some of the problems with the sixth cycle RENA numbers. The State Department of Finance did an audit of the Housing and Community Development Agency that formulated the sixth cycle RENA requirements and found that the data was not supportable, um, that there were many um, problems with the numbers, the data that they used for the modeling and actually performed an audit that came out with those findings in 2021. HCD has not um, acknowledged that audit, but is moving forward with, as you know, the very high six cycle RENA numbers, requirement mandates, unfunded mandates, <laughs> and uh, the infrastructure is a problem to support those numbers. I would like to ask that you uh, check out Catalysts for Local Control they meet every Monday evening, 5 o'clock, um, on Zoom. You can go to their website and link into it. Next Monday, they will have a guest speaker, Mr. Mark Reville, who uh, is excellent at uh, pub, uh, researching economic and population da data, and he has a lot to say that we all need to hear about the six cycle re RENA numbers that are very, very questionable. Um, do I have more time, or am I up? Okay, I'm done. Thank, Thank you very you much. Thank you so much for being here. Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online who wishes to, let's, what we'll do now, since we have a person in chambers and someone online, we'll toggle back and forth. We'll now take the first person who is online. Good afternoon. Hello, thank you so much. Um, my name is Rachel Sotos, and two weeks ago, I stood before you and suggested that the city of Santa Cruz 
establish something like a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, as they had after apartheid in South Africa, but for um, the public health, the era of the public health emergency of COVID. Um, this was reflected in the notes from the last meeting as a request for a COVID hysteria commission. And and I, I don't want to quibble too much about it, although it feels a little bit uncomfortable to me, uncomfortable in the, in the manner in which um, dissent is pathologized. But but I do understand, as I, I read a, a, a title of an article that uh, supported such a suggestion. But I, I'd like to clarify that I'm suggesting a truth commission. And truth is the operative word. And the pursuit is healing and the restoration of the fabric of the community. The truth is the operative word, but I would say that the attitude required is skepticism. And skepticism is required of us all now, as citizens and as public officials, because it's clear that the regulatory bodies, such as the FDA and the CDC, have been captured. Perhaps, you know, it was funny last Halloween to decorate your lawn with a tombstone that said, he did his own research. But that time has passed. We have the revelation of the Twitter files, Missouri versus Biden, the Pfizer documents that they wanted sealed for 75 years, but have only been revealed because of FOIA requests. California has rescinded the, doc the law criminalizing doctor speech, but the WHO pandemic threatened us all. Fortunately, people all over the world are waking up. In Canada, just recently, the National Citizens Inquiry gave their preliminary report. And I think that's a good model for, for all of us to look into as we pursue truth, truth, skepticism for healing and restoration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, hello, good afternoon. My name is James Ewing Whitman. You know, I can mostly recommend this magazine, The New American. It's got 13 articles on um, rescuing our children. Pretty interesting articles. So I spoke at the supervisor's meeting on the 19th public comments about an issue that I've heard talked about in this room, including the police audit, and in that room. And it has to do with um, a really crappy example of law of peace officers behaving as peace officers that has to do with the Santa Cruz police. This is an incident that happened on June 28th, 2021. And I don't know what all the remedies are for that, but I mean, I, there's, you know, there's dictionary length remedies. I know that, you know, for myself personally, I disobeyed an order that cost me $30,000. Went to jail for doing that. And I had to, uh, do a 52-week domestic violence class that I actually could have taught. So um, I'm kind of, I put them on notice. I'm putting all of you on notice as well because not much has happened and there's been, I'll just say it, favoritism in the other board, not with a, I'm not, a, I can't actually pinpoint which supervisor, but I didn't mean when I said favoritism because around that time, two other youth were taken away from their families and they've been, re, been reunited. So I can't say anything if you guys haven't seen that six minute and 41 second presentation that probably the easiest way to find it is uh i guess youtube forensic mama um but i'll send something to all of you so you can look at it because it's just interesting it doesn't just involve this council but the uh, supervisors and the santa cruz police and the sheriff's department in santa cruz but uh i i'm sure that something will change soon. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Ms. Bush, another person online. We'll take that person online. Good afternoon. Yes, hello, this is Garrett. Okay, one more time on this bridge marker. After reviewing the historical commission meeting records, I listened to them. On, uh, I was not surprised at the total lack of any specific evidence in their single-minded efforts to proclaim forever the incendiary idea of a permanent marker stating as fact that the Water Street Bridge lynching in 1877 was a product of racial terrorism. When specifically asked for the evidence supporting that conclusion, the commission stated there was no evidence because there was no trial, I assume, of the vigilantes. That is nonsense. Evidence is required. There sure was plenty of evidence the hung parties were hardened previously convicted criminals, also guilty of this robbery murder, having been seen at the time and nearby, having the stolen money and also their confessions, which provide a powerful revenge motive for vigilante violence, not racial terrorism. 
facts admitted from the flag. I'm not saying there weren't acts of racial hate or terrorism in California, but those had evidence like the Native People's Gold Rush genocide or Black Lives Matter Antifa acts of violent anarchy. Mm -hmm. Evidence of racism has to do with patterns of clearly racist words and actions, but we don't even know for sure who the vigilantes were. The existence of other lynchings in other places at other times, or if they were mostly Hispanic people, means nothing as relevant evidence. The observation that the book was written trying to prove the hypothesis that Hispanic lynchings in the West were similar to black people in the South is also not specific evidence here. That people gathered to gawk at those hung and took a selfie that was copied is not evidence of racial terrorism, but only of the age-old common public fascination with violent spectacle. Lacking specific evidence of racial terrorism, I regard the plaque as a dangerously incendiary revisionist lie typical of the cultural Marxist. False assertions of racial hate, such as Derek Chauvin versus George Floyd as a systemically racist policeman, led to real modern-day terrorist mass ultraviolence. Derek Chauvin was never charged with a hate crime because no racist evidence ever existed. Lies generate bad consequences. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, Ms. Greenside. Good afternoon, Mayor Keeley, Vice Mayor Golden, and Council Members, Gillian Greenside. I was going to send you an email, but since I'm here and public speaking, uh, and this is not controversial, but it will need some follow-up. Um, it's about the ability of the public to hear what is being said on your side of the dais. And this particularly applies in commission meetings because most, if not all of you, know to speak into the microphone. I have good hearing, so I don't know what it's like for people who don't. But uh, just as one example, I was at the Historic Preservation Commission on Wednesday night and uh, first off couldn't hear a word and I got up and spoke to staff who went over here and fiddled with the computer and got the system working. However, one, that wasn't the end of the problem. Um, throughout the meeting, there were times when one couldn't hear a word or just inaudible of staff making very important points for the issue I was there at. I respect the decorum of these chambers. I do not like calling out. But after I'd spoken, got up and said, we can't hear you, I had to, there were four other occasions when that same person uh, forgot to speak in the microphone. And when you do that, when you're that side, you can't hear. So something needs a reminder or something needs to be sent to all staff and commissioners to remember that there's the public out here and we come to the meetings because we're really interested and want to participate. And this is, it's not working at the moment. These microphones are very different from the old ones, which seem to pick up a broader, you know, uh, volume or whatever the word is, window of sound. These you've got to speak right into them. Uh, but I don't like having to call out, can't hear, four times in a public meeting when people are judging, how does she behave, and you know what I'm saying. <laughs> so uh, please address this, because this is a legal uh, matter as well. Your meetings are recorded for many reasons. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for bringing that to our attention. We don't, under all communication rules, we don't engage with you in, no. in a conversation. We got the point. Thank you, though, very much, Ms. Greenside. Anyone else online? Anyone else wish to address us on a matter under all communication? Seeing and hearing none, we'll move forward. We are on presiding officer's announcements. I have none. Statement of disqualification. This will be the opportunity for any council member who has a legal conflict to make that statement. Ms. Bruner. Uh, item number 12, 12, as it relates to my employment, that is the Downtown Association Parking and Business Improvement Area Assessments for fiscal year 2024. Thank you, Ms. Bruner. Any other council member? Any item? Very good. Additions or deletions to the agenda, Ms. Bush? There are none. Thank you. Attorney report in closed session, Mr. Condotti. Good afternoon, Mayor Keeley, members of the City Council. This afternoon, the Council met in closed session at 1 p.m. in the Courtyard Conference Room to uh, discuss the following uh, closed session items. 
Item one was a conference with legal counsel concerning liability claims. Those are the claims of Michael Lewis Sweat and Andre Deladier Almeida. Those are also listed this afternoon on your consent agenda as item number seven. And second item was a conference with legal counsel uh, regarding anticipated litigation, specifically the council met to consider initiation of litigation uh, involving one potential case. Uh, there was no reportable action. Uh, Thank you. Council meeting calendar, Ms. Bush, anything you want to draw our attention to on that? No changes. Thank you so much. We are on consent agenda. For those of you unfamiliar with it, what we will be doing is taking items four through nine inclusive as one item. We'll be voting on those as a package. This is the opportunity for someone to ask for an item to be taken from that. Uh, so that we look at it uh, individually. Let me start through with council members. Do you have comments or requests uh, with regard to the consent agenda? We'll start with Ms. Bruner. Ms. Bruner? I would like to uh, amend item five, uh, the minutes, to reflect uh, what the caller called in. And I just looked at my notes from um, the, that meeting, and so I would like to amend that to reflect. Why don't you do that now? Okay. If you have language, we'll, we'll I do. go ahead with that. So item five, minutes of the September 12th, 2023 City Council meeting. Um, the minutes state that Rachel Soto spoke regarding establishing a COVID hysteria committee. And my notes um, say that she spoke to establish, asking us to establish a truth and reconciliation commission that studies impacts during COVID. And the Federalist magazine renewed hysteria shows why we need a COVID commission to ensure Americans won't repeat the same mistake. You would like that added to uh, uh, the minutes to that item, the minutes on that. Thank without, you. Without objection, that'll be the order. Let me see. Do you have other items, Ms. Bruner? Ms. Kalantari Johnson. Um, I'd like to pull eight, seeing that um, our SCIU members are here. Item eight will be pulled. We will take that up immediately after our consent agenda item. Madam Vice Mayor, Council Member Watkins, Council Member Brown. I'd like to pull item four. Item four. Bail schedule. Okay. Any others on that? Mr. Newsom, seeing here none. Let me ask if there's anyone with us in chambers today who wishes to comment on or have pulled or ask a question about any item on our consent agenda. We will be taking four and eight separately. You'll have it if you're here on that, we'll, we'll, we'll be hearing from you separately. Seeing, hearing none, anyone online? Ms. Bush? Nobody with their hand raised. No, no one with their hand raised, okay. To move Did the consent. No, I'm going to okay. I'll second that. Motion by the vice mayor, second by mm -hmm. council member Watkins. Yep, without four and with, eight. with four and eight separated out, and with the additions uh, mentioned by council member Bruner. Clerk will call the roll. Thank you. If I can just confirm regarding the yes. minutes, um, typically we would listen back on to the recording just to ensure that um, the language matches. If you're amenable to that? Okay. Thank you. Gonna, uh, fine. That will be the clarifying direction. Good. Call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Aquilia? Aye. Consented and it passes so ordered. We will take up item four. This is a resolution updating the city of Santa Cruz bail schedule. Mayor, may, can, may I ask uh, just sorry. really a point of order, I guess. Yeah. Uh, it looks like we ha do have quite a few people in the chambers for item eight, and it no looks direction. like they may Glad be on lunch it. break. So um, let's, if we could do that first, Thank that'd you be great. For that. Thank you. Absolutely not a problem. Let's take up item eight. Item eight on our agenda. Excuse me for just a moment. Thank you. Item 8 is side letters of agreement with Service Employees International Union 
and supervisory OE3 duty assignment and shift differential for loan operators and other related changes. Uh, we have principal uh, analyst who, if we have questions, we can uh, ask that person. Uh, you asked for this item, Ms. Collentari Johnson, to be taken over into this. Would you like to make any opening comment? Uh, just that I noticed that our SEIU workers are here and wanted to give them an opportunity to speak to this um, outside of consent. Very good. Here we go. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'll be mindful of my microphone usage after earlier. I just wanted to take the opportunity to point out that this is a good example of us working through with uh, great togetherness from the bottom all the way to the top. So some of my higher ups have are present here in the chambers showing support and we just all together understand the value and critical nature of the work that we provide on what it is that y'all are about to vote on. And we appreciate your consideration of yes on this vote to continue the services that we provide and give us an opportunity to live with dignity and respect in the town that we appreciate. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. <laughs> Anyone else w wish to address us on item eight? Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Rome Norman. I'm uh, the wastewater collection manager. I also run the uh, public works after hours uh, duty program. Um, and uh, I'd like you to strongly consider the uh, report that will be in front of you from our chief people's officer and brought forward by Debbie Jones. Uh, these uh, employees behind us, they perform a very vital service uh, to keep our utilities and our city safe and running. We are a full service city and we provide uh, these services to our community. Uh, these people work very hard at great sacrifice. Uh, they do this because they love their city and they love their job. Uh, I am looking forward to your support and I think this is a very worthy uh, document that they're gonna bring forward. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else who wishes to address the council on item number four? Good afternoon, sir. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Keeley, council members, uh, Chris Coburn, Deputy Director for Water Operations. I just want to echo what Rome just said. In terms of the services that these employees provide and the need for this, you know, due compensation, uh, we're a 24-7, 365 operation. So that means Christmas Eve, New Year's morning, Someone's at the desk running the operation. And so things like the loan operator pay, the call outs when the middle of the night, the water main breaks, these guys are on it. Um, and it's just uh, about time that we uh, address some of these longstanding issues that needed updating. So thank you for your consideration of this measure. Thank you for your testimony, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, Larson Graff. With, uh, I'm the superintendent of water distribution. And a large part of what we do um, is reflected in this document, and I think it'll be an accurate representation of some of the holes that we've tried to plug in um, our operation. And I won't go into a huge detail about uh, all the different things that we respond to, but uh, I'm echoing what several people have said before, and just we need some uh, change, and we were hoping that uh, you folks will realize that and give us some support. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. <laughs> Anyone else wish to comment? Okay. On this matter, it is back before the council. We have a motion on this. Motion by Ms. Collintar Johnson is our second. Let me second by Mr. Newsom under discussion. 
Anyone wish to make a comment on this item? The Vice Mayor. I just want to make a brief, brief comment. I just want to thank everybody for coming down. I, I do always appreciate seeing you, but I do value your time and just want to let you know that especially where this was put on the agenda, that it was on consent, is something that's usually acknowledged that we're going to fully support. So you have the support of the full council, I'm sure, on this. And so um, thank you for your service, and, and we appreciate you. I think on behalf of the council, I'll say what she said. <laughs> there we go. We're good. Uh, clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Palantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so forth. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate your presence here and your good work. We're on item eight, Ms. Palantari Johnson. You, I, excuse me, we're on item four. Ms. Brown, you asked this item to be continued. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I, uh, I d so just so everyone knows, this is an update to our city bail schedule. This comes to us from time to time to reflect changes um, in the kind of county, the, the, the court schedule, bail schedule, but also other fines that are, uh, can't you can't hear me? Okay. Let's, Am I, let's just really? For just, let's I'll just, just wait for a second. A second. Yeah, we're, we're it's a it's a cheerful there. moment. <laughs> okay, there we go. Ms. Brown, back to you. Okay, hi, welcome. Yeah, thank you. Uh, welcome back. So um, I, this is the the bail schedule, and this comes to us from time to time with changes to uh, the amount that uh, we we fine for for different uh, violations of the municipal code. And uh, and then additions to for new um, new items, and so there's there's a whole list, and I'm not going to ask about the, in detail about the list, but I did have some questions on these changes, um, and I also have some comments. Um, so I um, and I'm not sure who I will be directing my questions hey, let's, to. Let's let's make sure we have the right person here. Yeah, so this can be you, Mr. Yeah, Condotti. It's going to be. Ms. Bronson will be answering this. Hi. All right. Thank you, Ms. Bronson. So um, I am, so under 5.82.110M, that's, I think it's like the fourth one down in the uh -huh. table. Um, on, so the, the, for, um, the, the code that I'm going to ask a question about is 5.82.110M. I'm just wondering what are the certain activities, uh, that the certain enforcement activities. It's, it's a pretty general uh, listing here. And so I'm just trying to get an understanding of what that, what, what you envision that meaning. You know, I was prepared for a lot of different questions, but not that specific one. Um, it will take me a little bit to pull up the municipal code. Um, so as you know, this reflects municipal code that's already passed. It doesn't reflect any change in the law whatsoever. So what you see here is basically the high-level summary of what the municipal code says. So to answer that specific question, I would need to review the municipal code, which I think Tony's probably doing right now. And, yes. and I really apologize for not getting okay. that to you in advance, because yeah, <laughs> they can Yeah, 5.82 is our side, sidewalk vending. Regulations. Okay, so, it's, so it, most of those are dealt with by administrative citation. So this is a specific classification of offense that would be issued an infraction citation that's processed through the court system. Great, thank you. Um, and so um, the next one I have is uh, six point one two zero five zero. Illegal storage of receptacles, scavenging. This is, um, sorry, this this one's 050. I think I skipped ahead. Illegal storage of receptacles. I'm going to go back to scavenging in a moment. Um, illegal storage of receptacles. Uh, what is what is that? Just the context for that would be helpful. I'm guessing Tony might pull it up before I do it, but I'm trying to. One sec. The, the 
this Good. section of the code deals with um, storage of refuse containers. And Commercial, I, residential, public, private. I apologize for not getting these to you in advance. I'm just trying to understand. It's not understand. specific to residential or commercial. OK, so just, just in general. It requires that they be stored in a man manner that's safe and sanitary. Gotcha. And, and don't obstruct sidewalks and whatnot. OK. Um, I see we're increasing the fines on scavenging from such said receptacles, uh, which is a little higher up here. Um, just wondering how, who will be in how do we envision enforcement on that one? I, it's kind of a question for a lot of these, but I'll, pick, I'll just ask for that one specifically. How do we envision enforcement for scavenging? I mean, I think it's fair to say that the police department would not prioritize that as an enforcement item. Probably, in most instances, it would be when a customer reports the scavenging activity that's an on, on an ongoing basis. OK, gotcha. Um, the uh, okay, so now I have another code number. I don't know what line it is in the table. Um, Ten point four zero point two seven zero. This is about idling, uh, something that was raised in our Westcliff discussion at our last uh, council meeting. So it's on my mind. Um, idling. H how long would an engine? Is, is there some standard around that? What's the what does the code say about? The length of idling. This section makes it unlawful for a person to uh, permit a vehicle to idle for more than 90 consecutive s uh, seconds, seconds while that vehicle is parked on a city street. Okay. I remember this ordinance um, as having really been, uh, ha having arisen out of concern for pollution and, and noise generated Absolutely. by Absolutely. Uh, vehicle idling. Okay. And then... The last one that I want to ask about is 19.05.170. Um, when do vacant premises become a violation of the fire code? Can you just get? Oh, 170. Yeah, It's on the, it's on page six, the last page of the table. So that section is, um, as you know, the city every three years adopts uniform building, fire, uh, electrical, plumbing, grading codes, yes. whatnot. Um, this is a modification to the standard uh, um, uniform fire code, and it states that Temporarily unoccupied buildings, structures, premises, or portions thereof, including tenant spaces, shall be safeguarded and maintained in accordance with 311.1.1 through 311.5. And so, I would have to refer to the fire code or to the uh, um, yeah to the fire code in order to give you that specific. Uh, no, not necessary. I just wanted to see if there was a, a reference point that I could get back to to understand where it's coming from. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I, I am not sure that people will are on the line who want to speak to this. I'd like to let members of the public speak who are inclined. I don't have any other questions, um, but I, I do have a couple of comments. Um, I'll save for after public, members of the public. Any other council member have questions on this item? Anyone with us who wishes to comment on this item? Anyone online who wishes to comment on this item? Nobody with their hand raised, no. Motion would be in order. Okay. I'll, I'll just, I'll move the, uh, I'll move the item. Council Member Watkins move the item. Vice Mayor Sections under debate and discussion. Council Member Brown. I, uh, uh, thank you. I just want to say that I am going to be a no vote on this. Um, this I've, I've been uh, on this body for uh, many years, and I've had issues with um, some of these updates over time. I don't disagree with many of them, um, but I feel that there are a significant number here that are really just focused on, um, you know, property poverty. They're really poverty crimes, and I I can't support 
uh, increasing fines and creating new uh, citations that um, that really cause people to um, you know to undermine people's ability to get out of poverty or to get off out of homelessness. So um, I, I won't be supporting the uh, item, uh, but I really appreciate the explanations on the the ones that I asked about and. Um, I'm sorry that we're we're here, and I, I I don't think that anything I say is going to change the outcome here. So I'm just going to leave it there. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember. Further debate or discussion? Seeing, hearing none. The clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom. Aye. Brown. No. Watkins. Aye. Bruner. Aye. Palantari Johnson. Aye. Vice Mayor Golder. Aye. And Mayor Keeley. Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. We're on item number 10. This is the second and final adoption, second reading and final adoption of a, an ordinance pertaining to prohibitions and limitations on wastewater discharge. We've uh, had this item in front of us on a previous occasion, which is why we're in second reading and final adoption. We will, uh, let me ask if there are questions by council members on this item, questions, comments? Anyone who's with us today wish to make a comment on this item? Mayor, I do have a, a couple of questions. Certainly. We'll, we'll, uh, Ms. Steinberg, just a moment. We're going to take the council member, and then we'll be with you. Do we have anyone online on this item? Not yet. Not yet. OK, we'll be right with you on that. Council member? Thank you. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to invite Mr. Babatola to uh, come up and, and answer a couple of questions. I, we were, we reviewed this item, this is a second reading, and uh, my purpose here is to ask some questions that I think others may have an interest in as well. Um, I, I don't want to take up a lot of time, but I think it may save Mr. Babatola time if some of these can get answered. <laughs> we'll see. Um, so, I, you know, I would, when you presented, I was really interested in better understanding the um, the, the changes that were taking place in, in terms of the substances you identify of concern in our water supply and the potential sources, you know, some were, were delisted and others came on to the list. And so it, I'd love to hear a little bit about um, where those are coming from, just your, more of your thinking about um, what's going on here with these changes and, um, you know, anything else that you would like to share to help the public understand and those who are inquiring with you as well. Thank you, Council Member. And thank you, Mayor and uh, City Council. Um, if you don't mind my introducing my Senior Environmental Compliance Inspector, Dave Martin. We work together with the other three um, staff persons and an engineering firm in coming to these conclusions. So the general question you're asking is we're making changes and some of those changes, the um, more immediate changes, focus on the idea that the reclaimed wastewater might become the next source of portable drinking water, whether within the city or for the purposes of pure water SoCal. The compounds that are bringing uh, additional resources to bear on these are as I presented them to you the last time, are acetone, formaldehyde, perchlorate, carbon disulfide, and bisphthalate. I could tell you more about each and every one of those things, but they're all important in terms of public health and consumption. And most of them had never been detected because we'd never focused on them since we were discharging simply to the ocean. And now we're discharging to sources that might become drinking water sources. And we were surprised at the levels of detection of many of these, specifically acetone and also formaldehyde. Acetone because we simply thought were just used for cosmetic reasons, but they're also used, it's also used for cleaning machinery and all that. So there must be a lot more industrial uses in the community that we hadn't focused on previously. Um, phthalates, I think everybody's already aware of because of the linings for straws and uh, other consumables and unfortunately they've now been identified in mother's milk and all that and 50 years ago you couldn't see that so it's important now that we restrict what passes through and becomes 
source material for drinking water. So that's the more immediate focus for compounds we'd never looked at before. And that's why we're proposing to come back to you in the next couple of years when we have harder numbers to be able to control those things. But we're putting you on notice that we're continuing the effort specifically because of those compounds. I'd also listed compounds that we thought that it wouldn't harm us to delist. These compounds are currently detected at great cost because there's a lot of literature that um, pinpoints them as being significant for, for environmental health at certain levels. But we couldn't measure them until about 10 years ago. Nobody could measure them reliably. We had the technology about 12 years ago, and we had enough data 10 years ago. So we added them. And so we've had a history now of how reliable we can measure them and at what levels we find them, dioxins being one of those um, groups. So we see these compounds at what we typically call um, parts per billionths of billions. In other words, it'll take you a few lifetimes to consume the levels we see before you could measure outcomes. So we're thinking we can save money by eliminating those kinds of compounds and focused more on the compounds that we still need to learn how to measure more accurately. Compounds like microplastics and things like that that others are beginning to talk about, but nobody has either standardized the method and therefore cannot really standardize controls for. That's the reason for delisting some of those, and I provided the list of those things we're delisting. And I think those are Broadly speaking, your two major questions. And then we also added vanadium and boron to the list of compounds that we now found that we hadn't found previously. And they're important in terms of the wastewater treatment system, which was the original focus of the local limits. Thank you. I think that those are that was my question. I wanted you to give you an opportunity. Um, if there's anything else you think is important to share since you're here, um, that'd be great. Otherwise, I really appreciate all of your work and thank you for being part of the team as well, sir. Thank you. And with that, I will uh, move the item. Second by Ms. Bruner. Let me see if we have uh, questions or comments from members of the public. Ms. Steinbrenner. I'll rescind my motion. Sorry, forgot. It's fine. It's under discussion. It's fine. There's a motion on the table, but please. Thank you. My name is Becky Steinbruner. I've been watching the Pure Water SoCal project since its inception uh, with approval of the EIR in 2018. Um, I'm aware that the um, Central Coast Water Quality Control Board will not um, be considering the approval of the city's wastewater permit release until December 14th, 15th. So I'm a little curious about why um, your council is taking this action. That um, permit is actually currently under public review and uh, public comment is open until October 12th. So um, I'm curious about that. The uh, section two of the resolutions does not include nitrosamines, which are a very common um, carcinogenic disinfection byproduct. And this effluent that the city's wastewater outfall will include after Pure Water SoCal um, brine return from their treatment plant on Chanticleer will be included in the city's wastewater outfall. NDMA nitrosamines are part of that. And it's not included in any of the um, components being monitored or included in your, your resolution here. I request that you do that or at least look into it. I also want to say that there um, is a leak in the city's wastewater outfall pipe. It has been detected for many years. It was shown it is being monitored in um, 
2020, Mr. Peter von Langen sent a letter to uh, Mr. I believe it was Mr. Babacola that they wanted some response about how serious the leak was. It has been showing up in annual dye plume um, analyses uh, two times in 2019. And the city is monitoring it. However, I do not know if it has been monitored since the very violent storms of 2023. I suggest that you request that be done. And if it is increasing, we need to uh, fix it. It needs to be fixed because it's pretty near the shore. And we are a beach town. Um, adding in uh, effluent from um, Soquel Creek's project will include carcinogens. And I think we need to fix that leak. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to address us on this motion in front of the council? Good afternoon, sir. Yeah, good afternoon. My name is James Ewing Whitman. I spoke briefly on this, what was it, two weeks ago? Um, you know, Santa Cruz County is really fortunate to have an incredible, mostly pristine watershed that I, from my memory, has been evaluated at a billion dollars. So I know, I don't remember exactly the loan that was taken out against it before, but so maybe three years ago. But recently, within the past month, the uh, uh, Environmental Protection Agency Bank loaned you guys between 123 and $127 million. So I actually have a lot of questions. I do appreciate that there was more information provided. Thank you very much for that. But I still question some stuff. Had I not been working, I probably would have bought a uh, container of fluoride toothpaste where it says if you ingest a piece not much larger than a pea, swallow it, you should call poison control. So um, fluoride is being added to a lot of people's waters. I know that it's limited here, but when things get consolidated, fluoride goes in the water. So a 50-pound bag, which anybody could carry, an adult could carry, it takes 240,000 gallons to um, bring that to a safe level, and I'm not exactly sure what the EPA calls what's actually safe. I question a lot, but if this building is 30 feet by 40, um, that is this building 600 feet tall to process 50 pounds of fluoride. So phthalates were mentioned. I, you know, it's 12 to 15 years ago that KPFA did a presentation where over 1,100 out of 1,200 chemicals contain phthalates. Um, those are synthetic estrogens. It's like that vinyl, soft plastic. It's really toxic at incredibly low levels. Now I look, how much, okay, I can see that. So um, kind of didn't have time to fully look at the definitions of maybe the 30 chemical compounds that were listed. Um, but dioxins weren't really listed. And I'm really questioning the integrity of the EPA, particularly with the train crash, which over 500,000 gallons of various chemicals were burned. So EPA tested for those chemicals, which turns into dioxins. By some people's calculations, a couple parts per billion are, are very toxic. So although this is just wastewater, and we're very fortunate to have a pristine source, there are areas around the country where water is being recycled and people are drinking that. So uh, I wish I had 20 minutes to talk about this. but. Um, Next to breathing, water is the most important thing that human beings need, and uh, and seconds not really enough time. But anyway, I'm just questioning some caution. I'll bring it up again. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone online, Ms. Bush? No one with their hand raised. Okay. Anyone else wish to address the council on this item, Max? Item is back before the council debate and discussion. We have a motion on the floor. Any debate or discussion? I will inquire. Um, I'm forward and bring your colleague with you. Um, and while you're approaching, let me also thank you for the public private uh, recognition last week of the ocean 
uh, clean ocean businesses in Santa Cruz who are doing a really good job of working with the city to make sure that what goes out into our wastewater system and treatment system is, is done so well. And these are the people in the private sector going above and beyond. We really appreciate your presence here. Now that you're at the microphone, would you uh, comment on a couple of the items Ms. Steinbrenner brought to our attention? I'll be glad to. Thank you. And um, starting with what perhaps would seem most alarming, the issue of um, toxicants coming out of the leak. Um, so the leak has been detected intermittently. That's the, the term of emphasis, intermittently, for more than 20 years. That's because it's such a slow, low leak. And the um, methods of detection, Peter von Langen, the engineer that uh, Ms. Steinbrenner cited, asked us to study it. And on the basis of that, we acquired boats and um, ROVs to do the best possible measurements that science would support. So we have dyes that are not particularly visible to the human eye. The spectrum is so sensitive. And we have sensors that we mount and look at how much of that dye under pressure comes out at that leak and 30 feet further, because the leak, uh, so everybody knows, is at 70 feet, and the diffusers are another 30 feet into the ocean. Altogether, this whole expanse is a little more than a mile offshore. So what we did, and Dave here was the principal person. We, we, what I did was to gather a group of scientists together from Ambari, from UCSC, and from NOAA to guide us in the studies. And Dave led the three other inspectors into the ocean to do the studies. And essentially, what was found was that the totality of what would come out of the leak under these extreme conditions would be the equivalent of what would come out 30 feet downstream in one of the diffusers. In other words, it's as they had described originally. It's a leak. It's a small leak. It would cost a few, maybe $10 million to fix it. It would be more damaging to the economy to break the rip wraps and then to try to reconstruct that kind of a leak. So not only did we study it, we studied it twice, and we're committed to doing that twice annually. And that's with the consent of the Water Board. So specifically, that question has been asked, and we have a system to ask and re-answer that question until we're certain that it's going to either deteriorate, in which case you would put in the millions of dollars necessary but if it stays the way it is, which is sometimes detect detectable, it's not worth the community's effort to do it. It doesn't do the damage that an alarm might <laughs> signal. I might quickly do. ask you that. And, and the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute and the other scientists you brought S along Sankos, yes. agree with that. Absolutely. Thank you. As to the sequencing between the, the Regional Water Quality Control Board and our action here, there's a sequencing question. From me or from? I'm sorry. There was a sequencing issue raised by Ms. Steinbrenner. And if I understood it correctly, it was that the regional board has a, a, the same or similar item in front of them. And if I got the import of what she said, it was, shouldn't we hold until they take their action, then we take our action? So I think, did I get that right? No, the, question, Thank you. Go the ahead. question she asked was the local limits question. And I think she thought, she probably still does, think that the local limits are part of the MPDS permit. They're not. So the permit can go on, and we've done local limits. This is the third iteration of it in my career here, and we've had like five permits. So they're not really linked. The local limits are mandated by the federal government for the specific purposes of making sure 
that you're not running a plant that's dangerous to the people in it, that you're not allowing chemicals into the system, that the plant doesn't have the technology to support, and also that what comes out of treatment systems, which ultimately will be in biosolids or in the receiving waters, are not going to be harmful to the environment. So the chemistry that we look at is focused on those things. And that's separate and distinct from the permits. The permit um, generally have to do with testing the appropriateness of the technologies that you have. It's called the NPDES permit. That's a National Pollution Discharge Elimination Scheme. That's a scheme that was started in 1970 that was specific to grading your ability to treat. It's a little different than the public health issues, environmental health issues that local limits focus on. The local limits tell us, allow us to tell the community on a defensible basis what can be treated, what's not harmful, and um, that's, that's a difference. So yes, the regional board is aware of the local limits, but it has nothing to do with the permits at all. The Thank permits, you. as she rightly points out, are in process of their own. Thank you, sir. Very much appreciated. Matters back before the council debate or discussion, Ms. Bruner. There was one more question um, regarding MDMA um, monitoring. Can you speak to that, please? Thank Absolutely. You. So it was one of the first items that struck us because of the potential to use it in drinking water. So yes, we sampled not only the city, but also in the county. And it, it just wasn't there in measurable quantities. Thank you. Further debate or discussion? Seeing here none, the clerk will call the roll. Can I, who moved it? Second it? I'm sorry. Excuse me? Motion. We Thank had you. a motion and a second, yes. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Calentari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Thank you for your good work on that. We're on item number 11. This is a tree permit appeal at 339 Walnut Avenue. There will be a staff presentation, then we'll hear from the appellant, we'll hear from everybody. Uh, but let's start with uh, Mr. Beck. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor Keeley, Council. Mayor. Give me a moment to pull up the sure. presentation. And uh, Bonnie, can you help me with the share function? Which share, the Zoom webinar share? Here we go. we go. Um, Good afternoon. So before we jump into the uh, particular uh, specifics of this appeal, I did want to just offer a moment a background and context on our urban forestry program for the council and the community. Um, urban forestry generally is the care and management of all of the trees in an urban area, including both those planted and those naturally occurring. In 2021, in the preparation of our street tree master plan, we identified nearly 14,000 community trees in the city of Santa Cruz. Those are trees in parks, along streets, other city facilities. That does not include all the trees in our open spaces, nor trees in private property. So that's a lot of trees um, to take care of. The Department of Parks and Recreation um, takes responsibility for managing the urban forest. 
And we have many different functions which are outlined here, including care. Have it, yes? Sorry, you're going to want to put it on the slideshow. Okay, after it. Now it'll work. Perfect, thank you. So including care of about 5,000 of those 14,000 community trees. We do tree planting. Last year, the city planted uh, over 300 trees directly. Emergency response, you may imagine during the storms last winter, how busy we were running around making sure the streets remained open um, and um, private property emergencies were dealt with. We do policy development, such as the street tree master plan I mentioned, uh, working on the objective standards last year to make sure that street trees are included in all new development projects. Plan review, following up on projects that come before the planning commission for review to make sure that heritage trees are being properly preserved, street trees are being included, et cetera. Permitting, which is what we'll be talking about today, and then following up with inspections, for example, on sidewalk opening permits to see if root pruning can be done properly, uh, code enforcement, and education. So it's quite a lot, and I just wanted to give that broader picture as we look at the specifics of today's item. So this is the appeal of the Parks and Recreation Commission approval of an application to remove one coast redwood tree at 339 Walnut Avenue. And again, to provide a little background in context, when uh, we are asked to review permits, we do so following guidance from city ordinances and council policy. So our heritage tree ordinance states that when a permit comes in for a heritage tree or shrub, the director or his designee or urban forester will make findings of fact upon which they either grant the permit, deny it, modify it, et cetera. And the facts that they're looking for to see if it meets criteria established in the city council resolution. And there are several criteria that can apply. In today's case, the criteria of um, interest is that the heritage tree has or is likely to have an adverse effect upon the structural integrity of a building utility or public or private right-of-way. So that's what we are looking for when we evaluate these cases. This is the tree in question. Uh, upon inspection by our urban forester, it was found to be sound, uh, in good health, not suffering from pest or disease issues, approximately 120 feet tall. This is the base of the tree. Uh, and it can seem as if it is two trees because of the two trunks, but because they're coming from a single point of origin, we deem it a single co-dominant tree. And the other findings from the initial inspection were that the tree is cracking the public sidewalk, curb, gutter, and street. It's cracked the sidewalk around the fire hydrant and could impact the water lines there in the future. And roots are growing under the adjacent structure of the apartment building damaging the fascia and uh, the foundation wall. And here's some photos from the inspection. This is the damage on Walnut Avenue. You can see the uh, fire hydrant there in close proximity to the tree. This is the sidewalk damage on Lincoln Street, the other side of the corner. Uh, here we have additional damage to that sidewalk as well as to the street in front of the property. And these photos show how close the base of the tree really is to the wall um, and the foundation of the building. This is taken from the outside and shows uh, some superficial damage to the fascia and apparent cracking of the foundation wall. And then a, a structural engineer who was retained by the applicants took these photos from the inside of the building, showing additional cracking of the foundation that occurred and the structural engineer, uh, Jody Collins, recommended that the tree be removed in order to preserve the structure. Now, with, again, at the beginning of a permit application, we have the choice of can we approve it, can we deny it, can we modify it? So a question is often raised, could something different be done in order to preserve the tree? Um, so in this case, uh, our urban forester concluded that the sidewalk area damage could possibly be addressed really by reconfiguring the sidewalk to um, take a different alignment. And in these cases, that would be the responsibility of the property owner to bear the cost of that. Um, but such damage would likely reoccur in the future as the tree grew. However, the tree is really too close to the building foundation, as we saw in those photos, to perform root pruning work 
according to industry standards without risking the health and stability of the tree, and therefore a root barrier could not be installed to protect the foundation. And these findings were also um, found by a consulting arborist retained by the applicants, Donald Cox, who recommended as well that the tree be removed and that no mitigation was possible. So that leads us to our recommendation that the City Council uphold the Parks and Recreation Commission decision to approve heritage tree removal. I just want to share one additional point before returning to that, which is the question of replanting. Um, our heritage tree ordinance requires that mitigation be done in the case of permitted removal of heritage trees. This is the text of the um, updated resolution that was passed by Council last November which calls for the replanting of either three number 15 container size trees or one 24 inch container size, 24 inch box tree on the property in the event of tree removal or else the payment of an in lieu fee that would cover the cost of planting and establishing a tree elsewhere. And in this case, the applicant has submitted a bond payment indicating their intent to replant on the property. So with that, bring it back to the recommendation. Uh, I'm available for any questions um, if you have them. Thank you. Let me see if there are initial questions from the council. Ms. Kalantari Johnson, you had a question. I'm sorry, uh, I need to see hand. Ms. Brenner, Ms. Kalantari. Okay. Ms. Kalantari Johnson, then Ms. Brenner. Questions over here? Okay. And, and Mr. Newsom. So let's go with Ms. Kalantari Johnson. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm curious, how, do we know how old the tree is and whether the tree was there first or the structure? We don't have an evaluation of that, I'm sorry. And was the tree planted by the, the, the excuse me, property owners or the city? You may be able to ask, it was not planted by the city. Okay. And you may be able to ask the applicants about whether they planted it. Okay. Um, okay, I'll, I have other thoughts, but I'll hold those. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bruner. That was my question as well. Mr. Newsom, okay, uh, do you have a question? I just have one clarifying question. Ms. Watkins. Just to confirm, our arborist as well as their independent uh, arborist also determined the tree needed to be removed based on the criteria, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. For the questions? All right, so that we understand the process, we all understand the process, uh, there will be an opportunity up to 15 minutes for the appellant, which, excuse me if I mispronounce your first name, Keelan Franzine, uh, and it might be Franzen, I might have messed up both the first and the last name, and I apologize for that. Uh, we'll have 15 minutes to speak and present any evidence that you want to present. At that point, a representative of Santa Cruz Property Management will likewise be permitted up to 15 minutes uh, to speak and provide uh, any uh, evidence they may wish to provide. We'll, we'll then have counsel and uh, uh, questions of the staff again, public comment, and then the appellant will have five minutes time to rebut. At the end of all of that, uh, we will have a uh, an action taken by the city council. Good afternoon and accept my apology. <laughs> That's okay, my name is Keelan Franzen. Thank you. Good. Good afternoon, Mayor Keeley and City Council. Um, I do have a PowerPoint presentation that um, I'd like to get on the screens. Okay, hi, my name is Keelan Franzen and I care. I grew up here in Santa Cruz, actually on Walnut Hill, um, just a, less than a block up from this tree. So I know it, I've lived by my whole life. Currently I live down on Chestnut Street and I can see this tree from my front porch. Um, so I, uh, I know I already did this for the Parks and Rec. We had a big um, hearing. It was really intense. Also, I apologize for quivering in my voice. This is very uh, nerve-wracking for me as I'm not uh, comfortable public speaking. Say, you're doing great. Thank you. There you go. 
Um, but I would not be here today uh, taking it up for a second appeal if it wasn't for um, three of the uh, Parks and Rec um, Council or uh, um, sorry. commissioners, commissioners uh, recommended that we took this up with the city council. They felt that this decision was, uh, you know, it, of course, this tree fits the criteria to be taken down um, and putting any burden of a, a danger on the property owners was a little outside of their comfort zone. Um, but they had hoped that maybe the city could find a resolution here. Um, so I want to say that, like, yes, this, the issue here is the, um, you know, the, the tree's going to keep growing, and it's right next to this uh, big building, big tree, big building. This is a huge tree. It's one of the largest trees in Santa Cruz. Um, can we go to the next slide? So there's two ways forward. Um, we can cut it down and forget about it, and problem solved, right? Well, I don't think that's, um, you know, I think it's a little short-sighted because um, if these trees roots are as immense as we think and are completely fused with this entire hillside, um, as they rot away, uh, will um, make a vacuum or a negative space under the entire road and the whole hillside, which is very steep here. This tree's holding the whole mountain in, if you can imagine. Um, and so the building will need these uh, foundation repairs anyway. So why not we take a separate uh, path forward where we improve the building uh, to make it last with a tree? Because um, if we, you know, think about like long-term future, um, this mid-century mid apartment building, you know, it's been here a long time. It's a really great place, and it could continue to be for a long time. But the lifespan of any building in Santa Cruz won't come close to the lifespan of this species of tree. Sequoia sempervirens have been known to live up to 3,500 years, and um, that's the oldest documented one, and it was only um, killed because humans cut it down. Um, so it's, you know, biologically immortal, to, so to speak. It's the only thing that uh, will make it die is uh, someone killing it. Um, uh, I think uh, we can, you know, um, find a way forward. Uh, that, you know, think about in a hundred years when you're, uh, you know, your grandchildren are walking down Walnut Avenue and they see this great tree that's, you know, been there for so long right next to a building and so you can notice, oh, some work was put in to protect this tree because it's that important. Okay, next slide. Okay, so this uh, amazing tree in particular, um, I just want to talk just a little bit about it specifically because it is a, um, you know, a special tree. It's not any... Uh, street tree. It's huge. Um, it also has a, um, you know, 28 foot circumference at chest height, which is over 80 percent larger the um, uh, the required size to be considered a heritage tree. 80 percent larger than you know a lot of the heritage trees we see. You know, they're, they're nice and big, but this thing dwarfs them immeasurably. Um, it also has a really um, amazing structure. A lot of redwood trees have like hanging branches where they don't really provide too much of a um, shade footprint underneath it. But this one has broad upward reaching branches, which is very rare in urban redwood trees. Um, and it's something to be considered how much of a canopy this covers as it reaches more than halfway across the street. Um, and again, the, this hill uh, I've grown up on is always leaking some water. There's two springs, um, one on the lawn of San Anchors High that's always oozing and the other one right across the street. Uh, the water table is high here, and redwood roots, um, especially this one, are reaching very far and wide, you know, hundreds of feet out. Um, I have a, you know, our neighbor has a redwood tree about uh, 150 feet away from our backyard, but I find the roots in my garden beds because it's where, they, you know, they find the good soil and want to grow there. I don't think these redwood roots are digging underneath a dry um, crawl space area. I think they're soaking up the water that's just, uh, just above them. Um, also, while uh, trying to research this tree to figure out if it really was older than the apartment building, um, I found this aerial photo from 1952, as you can see. Um, and, you know, it is just a little black blob, so I can't confidently say that's the tree. But this is six years before the Lynn Wall was built, and it is, um, looks like there's a tree right in that same spot. Um, I would also be in incredibly surprised if this tree is um, the same age as the building based off its size and how much it's grown. Um, the other thing, uh, Walnut Avenue is famous for its tree tunnel. A lot of the like tourist Santa Cruz pages often post photos of Walnut Avenue because it's so pretty. 
the tree tunnel there is amazing. Everyone likes to drive up that street. Um, this is one of the only native trees that's part of that uh, canopy, and um, you know, it's it's a uh, the section of walnut right there is very concrete. There's retaining walls on both sides. It's a big gray wall here and a big gray wall there. And uh, if we take out this tree, it's going to be a big hole that's going to be felt by everyone, all the students, everyone that lives here. It's like a big void um, that won't be um, able to be you know, replaced in any of our lifetime. Um, so next slide, please. So there's a lot of reasons to care. It's more than just a tree. Um, you know, these points I kind of feel like we're all pretty familiar with, um, and, you know, running a city and like we talk about the, um, you know, the tree master plan. It's really important to have trees. And this one's specifically important because it's so big. Um, but, you know, uh, it's, uh, this little area, this corridor has several other large redwoods there. And there's often uh, birds of prey, hawks and owls. Um, I see them, I hear them. Uh, you know, as I walk by, they're there. They're very important. We have a big rodent problem downtown, and these are the really the only guys helping out with that. So it's really important to find, you know, with, with this canopy being removed, it's not going to be replaced, and that continues to shrink. Um, the diff diffusion of noise is really important. You know, the, the big concrete walls there just reflect the noise, and, and this tree's um, really broad canopy. Oops. Uh, sorry, my mouth is so dry. I'm trying to conjure up some. Spit. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then uh, the amount of oxygen this tree produces is enough that probably each one of our breaths in this room right now has a little bit of the molecules that this tree made. It's quite immense how much oxygen a mature redwood tree can make. Next slide, please. Um, real climate change mitigation in a, you know, in a time and in a place where we really care about this. Um, trees are legitimate um, tools to use. Um, redwood trees hold more than three times the amount of carbon as uh, any other tree on Earth. They're massive, and they like, you know, they hold it in. They are rot resistant. That um, carbon that they capture stays in physical form. Thank you so much. She's a full service city council member. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, you saved my life. Um, and. Uh, so, so, you know, we're like trying to follow, find carbon solutions and this one's right here. It's been doing its job for, you know, decades. And, um, you know, it's, it's a very valuable tool and we can't squander it. Temperature regulation as well. This uh, tree shades more than half of this 19 unit apartment building and uh, just the energy uh, reduction that, that <clears throat> brings is immense. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is a quote from our city arborist, Leslie Keedy. Um, she was there at the last appeal um, arguing against me, and I just found so many good quotes. And I uh, um, just really want to say, um, you know, I really support um, the work arborists do to ensure uh, trees have a place here. Um, but I just, I, I find a little bit of a, a con like a contradictory uh, statements by the what arborists say and what arborists actually do, as, as in like, um, you know, um, allowing for uh, trees to be removed without further work put into them. So this quote says, as the natural canopy declines in the third world in our country, the urban tree population is really what we're relying, what everyone's relying on to mitigate global warming. Um, this quote comes from a Good Times article that is from 2016, it's really worth the read, uh, titled, Does Santa Cruz City Deserve Its City USA designation, um, and this article just talks on and on about how many big trees we've lost, um, and like it, it really talks between 1995 and uh, 2015, I believe, and um, over 4,000 heritage trees uh, were approved to be removed. That's about 80% of the applicants filed were approved. Um, yeah, next slide, please. So um, what if we just slow down? Um, I, I really think this, this whole process was expedited by this sidewalk being broken. And uh, you know, the property owners were um, made aware of that situation. And uh, you know, they, they see, oh man, this tree has really gotten big on us. What do we do here? Oh, just cut it down. So it's like um, something that I've noticed is my entire life, this tree has been just about the same size, sitting just about as close to the building with very little, if any, 
uh, maintenance care to prevent um, a sticky situation like this, where it's, you know, we're between, you know, uh, there's no like easy, good solution. So, um, you know, this uh, are two Google Street View photos from 2011, 2022. Um, the tree is just about the same size. You can see even zooming in, the trunk is, is sitting right in the same place on the sidewalk. It's not, you know, exploding with growth rapidly. It's a very mature tree that's growing at a steady rate. Um, and, you know, I, I, I've seen it my whole life. And when I finally saw the, the permit to remove uh, poster, I just, I was, I was heartbroken because this, there was so many times to have done something and it's just like, oh, the sidewalk's broken. Uh, you know, we got to tear out the whole tree. Seems a little short-sighted, like, you know, what's pressing up against the building right now is, is dirt um, that, you know, it's fallen there. There's a lot of, uh, this is a very steep little area. The, the building itself is under the grade of the sidewalk, so there's like a bit of a trench there. So the dirt is always eroding and falling down, getting compacted against the brick facade. Um, and this could be, you know, cleaned out and removed, and it gives feet of breathing room to um, the building. Uh, and I really do think that kind of stuff makes a difference, and this isn't a, you know, urgent removal. The building's not going to fall down. These cracks could have been decades old from an earthquake. Um, we're not even sure they are from the tree. That is something that is um, uh, written in this, the Arborist report. It says, um, I'm not going to bother to find that right now, but it's, uh, there's a lot of uh, things in here written about the building's uh, structure that are not um, necessarily connected to what the tree is doing here, like vents being clogged by leaf litter, you know, there's, that can be amended without removing a tree, and the rotting joists underneath will need to be replaced regardless if the tree is there or not. And I just think a lot of uh, the decisions made to protect the building just think of the tree as a nuisance, which it certainly isn't, as it is so important. Um, next slide, please. So uh, the solutions, like if, you know, like we're stuck in a place, like what are the solutions? If there isn't any, you can't work around it, I think that we could work around it because the, the way this building's built into the side of the hill here is very steep. There's access from under the garage to this specific corner of the building where the tree is near. And I think that construction can be done in a way, you know, I am not a uh, engineer and I, I don't mean to speak like I know what I'm talking about entirely here, but doing some simple research online, uh, foundation underpinning is used often to uh, reinforce threatened foundations. Um, and there's many different types of it that could be implemented here. And one thing I want to uh, speak of about redwood trees in particular is their roots are, um, you know, we, like the, the industry standard not to damage the roots um, is, you know, important. Um, but I've seen redwood trees survive uh, catastrophic fires 100 years ago and continue to grow with an entirely hollowed out root system. So I think some careful root pruning would not uh, knock this tree down, especially since it has such a wide, uh, immense base holding it sturdy. Next slide, please. Um, so the sidewalk as well, uh, it seems very obvious to make the sidewalk a little bit curved, just like it's done on, uh, for this large redwood on Church Street, which is just right up the block. Um, it also encourages the tree to grow where it has room rather than towards the building. Um, and this intersection itself is, um, or, or Lincoln and Walnut meet, is a uh, place that kind of needs a crosswalk. I see a lot of jaywalking there. It's just when you walk up Lincoln, you just want to cross. It's where cars go fast. This whole area could be improved. Maybe that can be considered when moving forward. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I've kind of hit on a lot of these points already, but um, the average trees are dwindling. Um, and I don't, you know, um, as, as someone who really loves Santa Cruz, I. I I don't love how we treat our trees. All the new trees I see planted are crepe myrtles or um, other uh, what I like to call horticultural atrocities. They are not native and they do not provide anything to the ecosystem rather than just looking like a cute little rendered 3D tree. Um, I think that uh, we need to really uh, focus on conserving what little native giants we have left. Um, and choices like these can really um, make a big difference worldwide. Like if. If Santa Cruz says, hey, we're going to save this redwood tree, we're going to show them that we can, then a lot of other trees down the line could be preserved as well. Um, one thing is like the, the, the housing that this apartment building uh, offers is really important. And I think 
there is a way to, um, you know, prioritize this housing and protect the tree. I don't think it's, um, you know, one or the other. And then uh, the last slide, please. Perhaps this tree may meet the criteria to be removed. However, maybe this criteria does not align with the values of our community. We implore the city to be responsible for offering alternative solutions to protect our deeply loved native heritage trees from being cut down. Financial and engineering support, and at a minimum, the city should be responsible for providing thorough considerations of all possible solutions. The tree is worth the effort. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. This would be the opportunity for the applicant, a representative for Santa Cruz Property Management, uh, to make your presentation in support um, of the appeal. Good yeah. afternoon. My name is Mary Barter. Um, my husband and David and I are here. We're half owners in that building with our sister and brother-in-law. And we've owned it for 36 years. Um, and we, um, we, we were Santa Cruz. Let me, let me ask Excuse you. Excuse me. Could, yeah, you, you have a nice uh, soft habit. voice. So just if you could speak right <laughs> into that. Is this good Great. right you. now? OK, thanks. Um, we lived in Santa Cruz at the time, um, and then in the year 2000, we had an opportunity to move to Hawaii, which we took, and from then on, we've had managers managing, managing it. And, um, but we come to visit it often um, to see what's going on. It's not like we woke up one morning and said, let's go cut a redwood tree down. Um, we got a call from our um, management company saying that the city arborist had called and said that um, there was a problem with the... Um, the sidewalk. And so we got in the car and came up here and um, we um, looked and the first thing we saw was, oh yeah, that's really tearing up the sidewalk. Um, and then I looked at the building and I saw the fascia's falling off and there's some cracks there. That doesn't look good. So we called up the arborist and they said, yeah, they had seen that also and um, suggested we get a structural engineer because we just didn't know, you know. So, um, I, um, I think we got another arborist, um, and I and we talked to the tree people, which um, our partners are on the board there, and they donate tons of money to the tree people. Which, their job is, kind of a lot of it is urban trees as well as planting forest trees, and so they, you know, kind of looked at the pictures and looked at the reports and said, you know, they agreed with that the fact, and I mean. Um, the appellant made some inaccurate statements that the only way redwood trees die is if we kill them. I mean, forest redwood trees do die. All trees die, you know, from time to time to make room for other trees or whatever is going on. Um, and it's not like um, we think that tree is a nuisance. We love that tree. We love the other one that's on the other side of the building, which is a, a better distance from it. We've never thought that tree was a nuisance. We always thought that it added... Um, a great deal to the property and, you know, just walking around. Um, but it's very worrisome what those roots are doing to the building. That's a, where that damage is happening is three stories below because it's a two-story building and then it has underground parking. That, um, those cracks weren't there because when we bought, when we bought the property, because we looked all around, you can see the foundation in the garage. The only place that those cracks are, you have to go into um, a closet that we have there. And so we went into that closet and those cracks weren't there. So there were no cracks when we bought that building because we did buy it at the time of the earthquake, after the earthquake. So that was something that we were very careful about. And we've done a lot of maintenance and improvements on that building. We're about to do some more, <laughs> not, which does not include what this is, because this would be a big deal also. So um, it's an 18-unit building. It's pretty occupied almost all the time. It's n n almost never you know, any kind of vacancy of, of even a month. Uh, it's very popular because you can walk to town. The bus takes you right up to the university. Kids we've had lived there, gone to the high school across the way. Um, and, it, you know, it's beautiful. And it's sad. I don't, you know, I don't want that redwood tree to go either. But I, I really, you know, a lot of wishful thinking was what I heard of what we could do to save the tree and the building. 
but the only experts we've contacted who are real experts say that the building will continue to be damaged by the tree, whatever solutions they saw. And we haven't gone further with a structural engineer, but that's who we will hire next to figure out you know, how we save the building, what, what we're going to do. And of course, that depends on what you decide here also, um, you know, what our next moves would be. So I don't have any other presentation. That's, that's all that it is. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you for your presentation. Let me uh, move to uh, questions that council members may have of, uh, of Mr. Beck or others. Council Member Newsom. Uh, thank you, Mayor Keeley. Uh, and I have um, a couple questions uh, that I'd like to ask. My, my first question is uh, for the city attorney. Uh, so we saw that uh, the tree is buckling the sidewalk, and, we, and we've heard that it will potentially buckle the sidewalk uh, further, even if we moved it out. Does uh, a tree buckling the sidewalk create a liability issue for the city and nor the property owner? Yes, thank you for that question. Um, I have a somewhat complicated answer. But under our municipal code, the owners of adjacent property are responsible for maintaining the sidewalk in a safe and passable condition. The code also says that if, as a result of the failure of a property owner to maintain the sidewalk in a non-dangerous condition, um, any person suffers an injury, that the property owner is liable to that person um, for the resulting damages. And if the city is sued in that situation, then um, the city has a cause of action for indemnification against the adjacent property owner. However, the code furthermore provides that um, no liability to the adjacent property owner shall arise under the code uh, where an application for a permit to correct a dangerous condition has been applied for and denied. Uh, so in that event, the city would be liable for a dangerous condition. I'm not suggesting that that sidewalk couldn't be repaired with, without removing the tree, um, but that addresses the liability question that you posed. Okay, so it does create some liability for both city and... That's right. Depending on the and, situation. And honestly, even when a um, situation arises where there's, there is not a permit application, um, even though we have that indemnity provision in the municipal code, we still get sued for uh, you know, alleged dangerous conditions of city sidewalks, and we still have to incur the cost to defend those, even if we have a claim for indemnity against adjacent property owners. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so my, my next question, uh, well, my next question was for Mr. Beck, but he's already answered it by um, uh, um, showing us the mitigation requirements for if, if this action were taken today, what the mitigation requirements were being. Thank you for that. Um, so my next question um, kind of looks further down the line uh, than just the mitigation efforts to this action, though it does uh, inform kind of this action and, and or the mitigation effort to this possible issue. And I want to provide some context uh, to this question. This question is really for... Uh, uh, Director Elliott. Uh, so we as a community care deeply about our, our natural environment, especially in uh, the urban areas in our community, uh, such as downtown. Uh, and as the representative of downtown, my vision is for downtown to eventually be a place where people can work, live, and play in an environment while in an urban environment while surrounded by a green um, landscape under a tree canopy overhead. Uh, a beautiful, lush urban forest uh, that will make our downtown really one of a kind. Uh, and the action that's under consideration today, if it were to be taken, the mitigation requirements will replace one tree with three trees in our urban forest in downtown. Uh, but my question uh, over the next, uh, for Mr. Elliott, is over the next year, will more trees or many more trees, much more than, say, just the three trees for this, uh, be planted in my district and particularly in the downtown area and from an equity standpoint, standpoint in the Beach Flats area, which is also neighborhood, which is also in my district? Good afternoon, Mr. Elliott. Good afternoon. Thank you for that question, Councilmember. I'd actually like to lean on our Park Superintendent Travis Beck to help uh, respond to this question. Yes, uh, Director Elliott, thank you for that question, Councilmember Newsom. Um, yes, we have plans to uh, do additional tree planting in the downtown area and Beach Flats um, as part of the uh, Council direction following the Library Mixed Use Project. We've been asked to plant 24 trees in the downtown area. We're also evaluating a number of other opportunities um, to increase planting in that area. Uh, we additionally have just received a grant from the USDA Forest Service 
for um, one million dollars to do better tree care and tree planting in our opportunity zones, which include the lower portions of downtown as well as beach flats. So we'll be exploring over the next several years how to um, best implement that. And we are working towards the goals of the Street Tree Master Plan to do additional planting as well as our Climate Action Plan, which uh, charges us with planting 3,000 trees by 2030. Thank you, thank you, and that is uh, that is wonderful to hear about that grant and uh, one million dollars towards planting new trees in our uh, in our community, especially in the lower downtown and beach flats area, but also underserved areas as well. So, thank you. Further questions from staff by council members? Did you? Excuse me, Ms. Brenner. I'm sorry. Didn't see. Yes, please, Ms. Brenner. Uh, I I think. My question is for the property owner. Um, I'm curious about what alternatives you've looked into um, besides tree removal. Well, what we've been told by the officials is that we need to take the tree out. <laughs> and we have a, a structural engineer that says, and an arborist that both say, that's probably what need, or you know, in their expert opinion, that is what needs to happen. So we're waiting for that to be go to go forward, and then you know talk to engineers and people who do building and do all that stuff, you know, um, and we'll we'll be working with anybody that we need to be working with, um, but we're not the ones that can really say, you know, oh maybe we could do this or maybe we could do that. All we can do is consult experts and tell you what they've said. Understandable. I appreciate that. Um, I, I certainly wouldn't be an expert. I mean, we're, we're horrified, right? It yeah. It's really it's, where we're it's at. It's the building. To me, the sidewalk is, is a workable solution, potentially, um, but the building... Potentially. It's just that it's... I'm wondering. I haven't looked at it, you know, in the last few months, because this all started in March, and then it just kept put off and stuff, and, you know, the recommendation was to take it, take it out. Mm -hmm. So... Um, yeah, I mean, they call them Semperverans for a reason. They, you know, they just keep growing. <laughs> I, I asked the question because the appellant brought up alternative options yeah. Yeah. to taking the tree down. And I don't know the, the expert fact behind that. Yeah. And yeah. so I was curious yeah, if was, your well, experts you should, we had got, any. We got a report from a structural excuse engineer. Excuse me for just a second. You. Let's do this. Let the council member ask oh, her question okay. fully, and then we'll let you answer fully. Go <laughs> ahead. It sounds like um, alter. I. It sounds like maybe alternative options um, were not recommended by the experts that you consulted with. A structural engineer. The structural engineer and the other arborist both con concurred with the first opinions. Um, it's not like we told them we're going to pay you more to tell us what we want to hear because we don't know what we want to hear. We're not experts, you know. We, we love that tree. We've come to the, um, to the city before when it was damaging the roof and, you know, had to have approval to just cut, you know, one branch. And um, anyway, that's, that's it. So if, you know, we, this has already been four months. I don't. I don't know. I mean, if we need to do more and find out more, if anybody needs to get more experts, I mean, please go ahead. You know. Yeah. My my. Um, where what I'm thinking. My concern is the housing mm -hmm. and the apartments and how many apartments are 18, there? Eighteen. Eighteen I've, units. I've been by there. I drove by there, and you know, we're we're in a housing crisis and. You know, and I don't take it lightly to that a tree is um, potentially being asked to be removed, especially when as beautiful as and and magnificent and giant as this one. Um, yeah. But the fact that the housing is, you know, impacted is what I'm trying to understand, and yeah. and what the expert recommendations have been around. Yeah any options for the housing to get around this? I mean, I think you should have the our, the reports that we got yes. because we got them from you. So um, that's all we know. Thank you. Yeah. I okay. appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Ms. Collins, Johnson. Thank you. Um, 
uh, to you both for the presentations that you made. Um, I have a question maybe for Mr. Beck. Um, so let's say we support the appeal and we do not cut down the tree. Can you paint a picture of what that will look like in the next three months, six months, a year? Um, that's a good question. I'll begin the process. Others may wish to chime in. Um, if the appeal is supported, then um, it's back on the property owner to determine how they want to address the sidewalk damage. And we would probably work with them in our public works department to develop proposals for the reconfiguration of that. Um, and then if they wish to preserve the building um, and do construction work in the vicinity of the heritage tree, then they would apply for a further permit and we would evaluate whether that construction work um, could be done safely or preserve the heritage tree. Okay. Okay. Um, so my next question is, what do we have in place now so that this doesn't happen again? How are we dictating what kinds of trees, where, proximity, or, or do we have anything in place? So that well, we're faced with the situation where we're picking building or tree, both which our community clearly values. The resources that we have available as a city include our approved street tree list, mm -hmm. um, and we are in the process of updating that list to more clearly identify trees that are appropriate for small spaces. Um, so someone planting a tree in the future might be able to consult that list to pick an appropriate tree. And then as I said, we do the um, plan review process in coordination with our planning department. And so we leave it to project designers, uh, landscape architects to propose tree plantings in, in, in coordination with buildings, and then we evaluate those um, to identify any potential issues. Okay, thank you. Ms. Brown. Thank you. I, uh, I wanted to respond to the question about, um, you know, an, an engineer's view uh, or a non-engineer's view, as uh, we all are, <laughs> of uh, what can be done as an alter potential alternative. And with respect to the sidewalk, um, I, I, I talk to a lot of engineers and a lot of, kind of circumstances around infrastructure development in our county, and in particular, the Transportation Commission. And what the engineers say is, uh, with enough money, you can kind of do anything. So um, I, I want to put that out there that uh, this is, um, as all tr tree... Uh, appeals seem to be uh, a question of economics versus the the value of the tree, and and so so I want to ask a, perhaps a rhetorical question: What is our heritage tree ordinance for? I have yet to, um, in my seven years on the city council, see a tree appeal supported. Not one. So I want to ask us all to think about. The, um, the commitment we have to preserving these trees, right? Heritage trees, large trees. This tree is, um, w was there before the, the building? I don't actually, I don't think that that's the most important question to ask, but it clearly was. And it, it clearly is a healthy tree. Our own uh, arborist has said that. The problem is uh, the it's going to cost money to save it. And, um, and so I want us to all think about that. And I'm, I'm, I'm willing to have that conversation. Um, but I want to ask the question with respect to the public infrastructure, the sidewalk, um, what, could, could the city make an investment to support fixing that in a way that might be sustainable. It's, it's not going to be sustainable over the, the long term, no matter what, because infrastructure fails. Um, you know, buildings get to the end of their useful life. Um, but at least in the, in the term, for the kind of medium term, um, could the city be involved in trying to find a way to address that issue and not leave it all on the property owners there? And that's a question for the city staff, anybody who'd like to 
answer. I, I can take one stab at it. From the Parks and Recreation Department, in terms of our budgeted funds, we have a Heritage Tree Grant Program that we use to um, cost share for um, property owners who are taking measures to care for or preserve heritage trees. Um, typically, that's $25,000 annually, and typically that's well spoken for. So I don't know that a 50% cost share would you know, cover the entirety of that budget. Um, I know the Public Works Department has a sidewalk fund. I'm sure they have many planned uses for it. Um, so I won't speak for the Public Works Department on that front, but of course it's up to council direction. Good afternoon, Mr. Nguyen. Good evening, uh, Mayor, Council Members, uh, Travis. Yeah. Uh, Nathan Wynn, Director of Public Works. I can speak for Public Works, Travis. Good timing up here. So we do, uh, the city, we do have a sidewalk in lieu fund that um, is funded by development where projects can't install a sidewalk where it doesn't necessarily make sense to install a sidewalk as part of their project. And so we have those pro um, developers pay into this specific fund that we then utilize to either build sidewalk or um, with other projects, using it like leveraging for other uh, grant funded type of projects. Now, sidewalks in the city of Santa Cruz, we have a lot of missing sidewalk throughout our city. And so it's really an ongoing effort for us to develop and construct these type of projects. Um, the sidewalk and lieu fund is a small a fund that we have. And so we typically do rely on this ordinance that we have to put the responsibility on the adjacent property owner to maintain these sidewalks. Uh, to uh, answer your question, Council Member Brown, um, the question about whether how much funding it would take to repair or maintain some of these sidewalks that are adjacent to a lot of these heritage trees, it is true that we can spend uh, additional funds to make thicker sidewalk, add more rebar, but in the end, it's a losing battle, especially with redwood trees that continue to grow. And so it is a constant maintenance and effort, again, that we try to share with the members of the public, but then again, we have our own challenges on trying to develop sidewalk as well. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Further questions, comments? This would be the opportunity. Let me ask if there are members of the public who are with us today who wish to make comment on this item. If so, please come forward. Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online? We do. Yes. Let's start with someone online. Hello, can you hear me? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a wonderful city council meeting. Um, this is actually my first city council meeting, so I'm just so grateful to be a part of it. Um, I'm a former student at UC Santa Cruz, um, and the first thing I noticed when I went to Santa Cruz was how beautiful the city infrastructure was and how it intermingled with the trees. Um, as of right now, I'm 27 and hoping to return to Santa Cruz for graduate school. Um, what I was studying there was feminist theory. Um, as we know, Santa Cruz has a long radical history you know, of activism, and um, when it comes to feminist theory and the environment, what, what we often see happening is people trying to say that the most important thing is, you know, housing, right? And I think that Keelan brought up so many beautiful points that these don't have to be contradictory arguments. These things can exist together, but the most important thing is that as a community, we get to come together and, you know, find creative solutions. Um, I've often seen sidewalks in Santa Cruz where the roots are destroying, you know, the sidewalks. And I think that, of course, that does need to be fixed in time. But as was brought up, um, once this tree is cut down, the amount of time that it will take to replace it is hundreds of years. So no tree planted this year or next, no three trees will get the same amount of carbon out of the atmosphere as this tree. And I think that, um, Again, as a student, I can speak to the amount of creativity in Santa Cruz and on the campus of young people who are working to create environmentally friendly solutions. Um, that includes, you know, permaculture design as well as like architectural design, right? That encompasses the environment. So it's not fair that this is all put on the property management. And I don't think, you know, anyone here wants to put it on the property management. Um, it's clear to me that the council cares deeply about trees as well as everyone you know, in this meeting, um, 
I do think that it's really important to continue to street, like to seek these creative solutions. You know, you could get the school involved, get students involved, ask them, hey, come up with a design plan. And I think that's what's going to have to happen if we really want to create a solution for climate change right now, because we don't have a hundred years potentially. I think, you know, we're all feeling the effects of what's happening. We see the floods, we see, you know, the heat increasing and fire risks. And what it comes down to is that um, all these solutions, you know, they need to focus on the environment first. Um, and it is a timely process, but it's one that we can do together as a community. And I think we're really lucky to have young people like Keelan, who does run, you know, a native plant business. Um, he runs new gardening. And so he does know what he's talking about. Um, you know, that the fact that the hill could collapse if the roots come down and that there might be potential to trim the roots is beautiful. So thank you so much for listening. Well, thank you so much for participating. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, City Council members, members of the public. I'm sorry, I'm a little disorganized. Um, I'm Veronica Ilze. I live in Santa Cruz. I'm the one who placed the call that started all this. I walked down Walnut as my main route to town. One of the reasons I walked down Walnut going to town is because I like the trees. It has more character, and it's more comfortable, and I hate Lincoln Street because it has all the drainage channels that if I miss them, I go down. Um, and I've noticed over the last couple of years at that corner, I don't know, I call it Walnut, Walnut, and Lincoln. Uh, <laughs> when I crossed there, it, first it started to get up and down little crevices and kind of goofy. And as I continued to walk on it, it got to the point where I couldn't figure out where to put my feet. I'd take one step and my foot would get caught underneath a lip because there was such a big uplift. At one point, I took a step and it slanted to the side and I twisted my ankle and fell down. I got back up. It's really a narrow place. I couldn't figure out how the high school kids were managing it. One point coming home from town, I got to the mess and I thought, I'm not going to walk on this. I'm just going to go on the street. I tried to step in the street and my foot went in a hole there. So I'm, I'm neither an engineer or an arborist or anything. I don't know what you could do from the sidewalk. They've done some grinding further down that I really appreciate. Some of the sidewalks, when they make them go around the trees, yeah, they go around the tree, but they go around a big hole. And so if you don't know you're about to come to one, you really got to be careful not to hit the hole. So let me start by saying that when I called the Public Works Department, I really appreciated that we have a Public Works Department that listened and that took me seriously. And they went out that afternoon and looked at it. So let's just not forget we have a city that does care about people. Now, as I said, I like walking on Walnut because of all the trees. And part of my dilemma standing here is, oh, God, am I going to get the label of there goes the blind woman that took down our tree? Because I love that tree, too. I don't know anything about what to do. I didn't even know I was walking past an apartment building all these years. But I hope, I'm sorry, is that my, my timer? Yeah, it is, but take, take a few more seconds and wrap up your comments. You um, I, I just really wanted to, to speak because I'm the one that made that call. And I'm very conflicted. I love that tree. But this sidewalk is impassable. And now what happens is right at the corner, I don't step up on the curb, but I walk out in the street. And now everybody yells at me for walking in the street. And then they yell at me because I don't know exactly when it's safe to get back up. 
So I make my best guess. And coming home, because I'm so scared of hitting that spot, I have to walk home on Lincoln and then confront my fear of all these stupid drainage channels. And I just hope that whatever we do, if we can save the tree, it would make me very happy. I wasn't, I didn't say get rid of the tree. I just said it's unsafe, it's untenable. And I hope that we can find some solution because I don't want to wait forever and not be able to safely walk to town. Thank, thank you, you so much. Well, thank you very much. Do we have someone else online? We will go to the person online, then we'll go back and forth as we typically do. So good afternoon, person online. Three, two, one. Good afternoon, Ms. Greenside. What are you doing? I'm doing that. I can't see the clock. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> some for some people it was on, and some others. So I was a bit worried that it. I was waiting for you to start talking. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll start. Thank you very much, um, Gillian Greenside. Um, I'm speaking in support of the appeal. I've appealed and over my 40 years of being concerned at the loss of our heritage trees in our city, many in my own neighbourhood, 20, 30 heritage trees gone. Um, I've made a handful of appeals. Not one has been successful. And this criteria criterion has often been used to take the tree down. Sometimes it's minor damage to an unpermitted garage tree gone. Another time the seaside company got their engineer who said, oh, the, the house is unbalanced. Mark Masiti Miller put his level on it, said, I don't see that. Nonetheless, the tree's gone. Um, I've, I'm not going to say anything about the beauty, the, the benefit of this tree. That has been well said. I would like to direct your attention to the comments uh, from the um, the applicant's um, structural engineer, uh, Jody Collins. Uh, Jody Collins found that there was damage or a separation of the brick veneer. The definition of veneer is just a sort of coating. It's not structural. Two vents were blocked. At the Parks and Rec Commission, where the vote was three to two, uh, with two people absent. The question was, well, what about the other vents? It wasn't answered. Uh, there's rot at the floor joist ends. Well, that will have to be fixed. And there were two cracks in the stem wall. Conclusion from um, Jody Collins was that the tree has caused minor, minor structural damage and cosmetic damage. So I would go on Mr Franzen's uh, request, slow down, slow down here. Taking the tree out is always the easiest solution and that's why they all go. But I feel that you are willing to think, slow down and think of alternatives. Obviously the sidewalk has to be fixed, no question. And that can be done that, so it would be safe for everybody who needs to navigate it. Um, but I'd like to ask a question, and phew, time goes, um, this is an old tree, much older than the apartments, and I really think it's incumbent on somebody to say how old it is. Ever looked at the tree rings in Henry Cowell? Sometimes there's an inch and there's 20 tree rings. So there's 20 years of growth, sometimes in less than an inch. So we talk about this tree like it's growing, it's going to grow. Next year it'll cause severe damage. I don't think that's accurate. I think the growth might be very, very small, and I think that you should be very concerned about getting rid of this tree, as Mr Franzen said, what will happen to that hillside. If you look at Cow Beach and the collapse of the hillside, I told the Coastal Commission, I'll give you five years before that cliff collapses because you took the trees out. It took six years. I was one year off. But the st stabilize, roots stabilise slopes. So there's that to think of. So I just urge you to slow down 
Uh, it's, this is not the wrong tree in the wrong place. This is a beautiful tree, and if we can just look at alternatives, since this is minor damage, I think that it would be good for the apartments and the tree. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Greenside. Do we have anyone else online? Next person online, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi, my name is Jacob Pollock, and I am uh, one of the uh, Parks Commission uh, Parks Commissioners that voted to um, keep the tree. And I'm not talking on behalf of the Parks Commission at this point, but I just wanted to give some uh, context to what had happened in there. Is one of the things, and I've, I've had a number of these, uh, these appeals come up, and it feels like we as a commission are working in a vacuum where we don't get the history of what's been happening with these trees, you know, with heritage trees generally, how many appeals have been made, how many have, have been successful, how many trees have cut down. Uh, and then we also don't, the other piece of the vacuum is we don't have a complete analysis of what it means. Generally, we, people look at it and as the last speaker said, that it's easy to say cut down the tree got no legal representation, it's got no liability, it's cut the darn thing down. I would like to see an analysis presented to us that uh, as for the public as a whole of what it would cost, how it would go about if we focus on how do we save the tree, you know, if that, if that were our main point of focus. And I guess I would recommend that we do a further analysis on this, things on that in particular before this is uh, really brought up, as, uh, that is, I would say, accept the appeal for right now and have send it back for a, a reasonable analysis that gives us some information which we can make a reasonable choice on. Um, the, I guess the other thing is that I just wanted to reemphasize that planting, you know, three cottonwoods or whatever the heck is going to be planted there as in replacing this tree is just not an equivalent replacement at all. And again, that's happened, you know, time and time again, uh, come before the commission and we end up you know, we're basically reducing the size of our trees and we're changing the, the type of community that we've got to these acceptable trees for the development as opposed to trying to create for us to having development except the trees. Um, so anyway, that I would support the appeal that we do not cut down the tree at this point and that we do further analysis uh, as a group to see what funding is available, to see what choices are really available. I don't, I don't feel we have a reasonable choice at this point. Um, it's a, it's a, between a rock and a hard place. Um, I would like to see that pressure eased. And thank you very much for uh, letting me talk. Thank you, and thank you for your service on the commission. Good afternoon. Goodbye. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hi. Uh, my name is Annika Mancini. Um, and first, I want to acknowledge and thank everybody for being here today and all the people who have spoken. Um, it's really wonderful to see the community come out and do things that are scary. Um, and I'm just here today because I know, I'm sure, that with the city's help, uh, we can find a reasonable way um, to mitigate the possible damage done by this tree. It's been outlined um, that there are grants, there are, um, you know, other things that are going on with the public works that we could access. There's something called GoFundMe that could help property owners. There are people within the community that I think would really be willing to donate funds and do all they can to save this this big tree. Um, as something that Keelan mentioned, this particular tree is 80% larger than the minimum heritage tree uh, measurement. And I think even if we're just basing this decision solely off of that information, I would still expect determination to find solutions to keep this tree because that's that's a lot bigger than, you know, the other, um, the minimum, you know, heritage tree measurement. Um, something Keelan also mentioned was that in the span, I think it was 1995 to 2013, 4,000 heritage tree permits were approved, which means 4,000 trees were removed, which means about 222 trees each year. And I think uh, somebody might have mentioned that the Parks Department is planning on planting three trees for removing 222 trees, which just um, kind of feels a little um, contradictory, um, I just wanted to mention. Um, I know with certainty that the people who live and commute downtown would be shocked and disappointed at the removal of this tree. Um, this tree takes up so much space visually uh, and you know emotionally that people are absorbing and enjoying its presence without even realizing they're doing so. Um, the apartment owners, who I really appreciate being here, 
don't live here and they don't see that tree every day and that I walk up that hill like three or four times a day going to my work and going back to my house. Um, and I think just emotionally, I don't know if they can really understand the ex extent that this tree takes up in our community. Um, I do have concerns that this appeal is framed as being anti-affordable housing because of the understanding that there is this big apartment building. Um, and as somebody mentioned previously online, um, the urban forest environmental movement and in all environmental movement is cut from the exact same cloth as the affordable housing movement. They are not different movements. Uh, you know, studies show that lower income areas have less trees. Um, you know, they don't get the benefits of having what those trees uh, provide, uh, which are, you know, major. Um, and those units should be allowed to have the greenery that they have. Um, we are not trying to remove housing for those people. Uh, nor are we attempting to burden the apartment owners with the cost. Um, if it came down to something like needing to relocate a few tenants, whether that's for construction or semi-permanently, I am watching those buildings go up downtown and I, I have a feeling that it could be possible um, to maybe make space for, for some people in there. Um, I know I'm running out of time. The one last thing I, I really wanted to say is that um, likely in the near future when this apartment building is passed on to the next generation, which it will be at some point, um, you know, this building is coming up on 75 years old. Apartment buildings don't last forever, um, and, and this tree would. And in 30 years, when I see that apartment getting torn down, and that tree will have been taken out for nothing. Um, so I'm just here to reiterate the importance of believing in change, changing the status quo. Um, obviously, the typical solution would be to remove the tree, but maybe today is the day to decide to root, um, move in the different direction. So. Next time you go to Poganip or Henry Cow, think about what, what makes this tree different, because it's not different. It's the same. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else online? We'll go to the next person online. Good afternoon. Hello, my name is Dana Bagshaw, and I did not come here uh, intending to speak on this at all, but I just want to raise one point. I do certainly... Um, tend towards the applicant and all the arguments. Um, I think the values of um, carbon capture are and love of, of, of natural nature in our city, our urban forest is very, very important. But what I would like to, I hear people say, well, we've got to take care of the sidewalk. And I would just like to think that with alternatives, we need to think outside of the box. Like, why are sidewalks sacred? I too am a walker, and I prefer walking in communities where they have some kind of asphalt or ground cover rather than the, the concrete, which we also know is damaging to the environment. And this is just one example of alternatives that could be looked at in, in how to approach this situation. And in the future, encourage developers and builders to think about the trees and plan for them and build around them. So anyway, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Hi, uh, my name is Izzy. I was born and raised here in Santa Cruz on the west side. And this specific tree is just like one of those trees that everybody knows. Um, I was like talking to my mom on the phone yesterday. I was like, oh yeah, we're trying to save this tree. And I'm like, it's like on Walnut Link. And she's like, oh my God, that tree? They're trying to cut down that tree? Um, also somebody who was, who was raised here. Um, and I think that if this tree gets cut down, it'll really, it'll really be missed and really leave a sore spot in our community. Um, and I really... Hope that y'all do everything you can to try to find a creative solution to save it um, and live up to our name as a tree city. Um, and I think that there can be a lot done with the sidewalk. Um, as Keelan mentioned, um, a crosswalk in that spot would be awesome, uh, would really increase the walkability of that area and the safety. It is a hill, people tend to zoom up and down it. Um, and it is, yeah, kind of a, tricky place to cross. Um, and I believe that a crosswalk and expanding the sidewalk, making it one of those like extra wide sections of sidewalk 
would be really great added value to the community, to the students at Santa Cruz High who walk up and down that hill all day every day. Um, and then just one more thing I wanted to add about this building. Uh, yeah, I hope that this building can be retrofitted and fixed, but from what I'm seeing, the damage is like very minor. Um, I have an engineering degree and I do a lot of like construction projects. I spend a lot of time looking at foundations um, and let's be honest, like all of our houses in Santa Cruz have cracks in the foundation. We have a really high water table. We have a lot of really underbuilt foundations. Um, cracks are like everywhere, it happens. It doesn't mean that this, that the units in this apartment are like close to becoming unlivable. Um, it's just one of those things that happens. Um, and this tree is growing really slowly. It's not about to burst through the walls. And I believe we can find uh, a way to retrofit the building to also continue to provide housing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have someone else online? Good to see you, sir. Come on. Good afternoon. Thank you. You as well. Uh, my name is Ian Johnson. I was born in Santa Cruz, and I've lived here my entire life. I'm now a property owner in Boulder Creek uh, in an area that was ravaged by the CZU wildfire. I think that we can all agree that the recent loss of untainted forest in Santa Cruz and really California in general is uh, truly shocking. Um, now more than ever, I believe that as we continue to lose our precious trees, we must fight to protect all that still stand. Uh, the risks to these majestic giants uh, have really been piling up. Um, I, I think that we need to consider every tree a precious part of the community. Uh, I've seen countless redwoods and other native species decimated by logging, forest fire, careless removal, uh, even in Santa Cruz County. Uh, multiple times a year, uh, PG&E hired contractors come to our property and tell us that they must remove healthy trees just because of their proximity to the power lines. Uh, these are above ground power lines that were rebuilt after the fire and instead of being put underground, uh, we continue to prioritize them over the, the native trees. Uh, I grew up under the notion that Santa Cruz was a little bit different than other counties. Uh, I believed that we were one of the few towns that protected our ecosystem and prioritized our native trees. Uh, but as I've grown older, uh, I'm not really sure if that's true anymore. Uh, outside of our state parks and conservation areas, um, well, it's a great start that we have those. Uh, it still leaves thousands of trees at risk. Uh, I mean, if we simply cut down any tree near a building, road, or power line, uh, we really won't have many left uh, in the heart of our city, at least not of that size and significance. Uh, as mentioned earlier, there's a host of reasons uh, why this is in no one's best interest to cut the tree down. Uh, it's simply the easiest path to solve a short-term and short-sighted issue. I truly hope that we can change the system before it's too late, as these trees are irreplaceable, at least in our lifetime. Uh, also, uh, in terms of accessibility, I think there are definitely solutions uh, to widening the sidewalk, putting rumble strips on the side to help guide uh, those who are visually impaired. Um, it, it's not just a, a one or the other solution. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. My name's Emily Love, and I have something that I've written that I'm going to read as well. Um, I want to address the city council members and ask that you imagine a future in which this redwood tree has been cut down. If this healthy giant is reduced to a stump, will you feel that you did everything you could pr to protect our city's natural resources? Will you feel satisfied that all options were considered? If you do vote against the appeal, will you, will you not feel regretful that you played a part in the removal of an endangered species? I know that there are many factors at play and this is not an easy decision. However, a tree like this will not grow back in our lifetimes. Since we have lost so many redwoods in our county in the past few years, the removal of a large specimen like this, especially in the heart of our city, should be more carefully considered. Thanks. Well, thank you. We have one more person online. Is that correct, Ms. Bush? We have two. Okay, so we'll take one of them now. Good afternoon, person online. Hi, can you hear me all right? Can hear you just fine, thank you. Great, hi, uh, my name is Harrison MacDonald. I was born and raised in Santa Cruz. I grew up right in this neighborhood. Um, I went to Santa Cruz High, so I got to walk every day past this uh, tree twice a day. Um, you know, just, I have a very strong emotional connection to it. 
Um, I was an econ major in college, and I'm uh, preparing to enter graduate school for a PhD in uh, economics. And there is a really useful um, economic valuation tool called contingent valuation uh, that people use to basically uh, evaluate how much something is worth when it doesn't have like a tangible market price to it. And so a really classic example is um, people will use it to... uh, value how much a whale is worth to people, not necessarily for the market value of its blubber or its oil, but the existential value of it to people um, can be enormous and can often outstrip the market value of, uh, you know, something like a whale or a tree, um, you know, the lumber in a tree. Uh, Just, you know, based on some, there's not a ton of contingent valuations for old growths out there, but there are some. And the lower ends of what I'm seeing based on, you know, there's an article from Smithsonian, there's one on a study they did about a redwood in Menlo Park, so, you know, one of our neighbors. Uh, the lower end of the valuation we're looking at is at least 50000 for an old growth redwood or a redwood of this size. And so, you know, let's say the sidewalk costs $10,000 to repair today, and 10 years from now we have to spend our $10,000 to repair it. That gives us five decades of this tree sticking around while we, uh, before it even starts to reach a point where the willingness to pay and the willingness to accept are at the same level. And by that time, the tree could be worth more to people because it's grown and maybe the cost to repair the sidewalk has become less or some other solutions have been found. So from an economic standpoint, making this tree, cutting down this tree does not make any sense right now. And so if a lot of you are driven by the numbers, I think, uh, it'll be useful for you to um, consider that in making your decision um, beyond all of the other uh, great points raised here. So that's all I want to say. Uh, Thank you everyone for a great meeting and um, I appreciate everyone who's spoken uh, regardless of what side of the decision you're on. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your, for your comments and testimony. Good afternoon again. Good afternoon. My name is Becky Steinbruner. Like Ms. L.C., I also reported this tree, um, the the sidewalk, to the city, never dreaming that this would be the solution to fixing a very dangerous sidewalk. Councilmember Brown, I want to thank you for your, your very poignant question. What is the use of having a heritage tree ordinance when we never protect them anyway? Here's your chance to do something different. The sidewalk can be fixed, and it can be fixed in different ways other than using concrete. There are places that have used ADA-compliant wooden bridges to span creeks, certainly. Why couldn't they be used to span redwood tree roots that are uplifting? This can be easily, cheaply remedied as if the roots continue to expand. We could also put handrails on that to help guide those who cannot see where not to go. I sent your commission an email yesterday with several solutions, one of which is to use epoxy injection into the cracks of the foundation of the building. I request that your your council uh, not take any action at all today on this, and to request that a, uh, there is a local company, Bay Cities Waterproofing and Restoration, that does in fact do this work, and they are in fact doing it at the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk. Let's have them come in and give an evaluation of what it would cost, if it's a practical solution to remedy this, the cracks in the foundation. I'd like to also thank um, Ms. Greensight for pointing out as I noticed also in the report that the cracks are in the brick veneer. The brick veneer can be removed and then we can see what is going actually on with the foundation. Um, I never dreamed that I would be asking for a tree like this to be removed. And if you cut it down, it will not die. They're called sempervirants for a reason. We've seen that now in the CZU fire. I've seen it on my neighborhood, on Redwood Drive, coincidentally, (laughs) that when people cut them down, they come right back with a vengeance, so with a determination to live. So simply cutting it down is not going to solve the problem. 
it will remove a, a wonderful tree that you have heard many people love, appreciate. It will remove shade in an urban area that drastically needs it. It will remove a tree that is taking up tremendous amounts of carbon dioxide. The studies I sent you in the in information show that the older trees are much better at absorbing and storing CO2. What I see as replacement trees are on the list because they're easy to maintain. They're not native. They're easy to maintain, and there's no way that you can make an argument that they would be as efficient and absorb as much carbon dioxide. They are, as Mr. Franzen said, horticultural species. They're not our native trees. So with that, please delay any decision on this until a, an epoxy injection can be looked at. Please look at what it would cost to put a wooden bridge over the sidewalk. And please fix the stupid drain channels on Lincoln Street that cause Ms. Elsie such terror and many others who are sight impaired. Thank, Thank you. you. Another person online, Ms. Bush. We'll take the person online. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Three, two, one. Good afternoon. Hello? We'll hear Hello, you in a minute. Me? Come on forward. Come on. Let's go. Hi. Um, Hi. Thank you so much for hearing us. Uh, my name is Oakley Yousat. I work as an ecological gardener. Um, I just wanted to reiterate what Keelan said about the long-term damages, even if the tree is removed, that will cost money. Um, I just wanted to say that I personally, just doing the work that I do, have seen the damages of removing trees much smaller than this one. Um, when the roots do inevitably rot, even within a couple of years, um, and how much that affects concrete around them. So I just wanted to say that whether we take the easy solution or not, we are going to face uh, quite a lot of financial burdens. And I also wanted to say that as an ecological gardener, I do all I can to plant lots of native plants and trees to mitigate problems like water going under buildings and sidewalks or just, um, I'm working right now on a project in Boulder Creek where because of the amount of changes that have happened because of the fires, water is flowing in ways that we're not used to because trees aren't sucking up that water. And the fact that we have this old redwood in this spot that has multiple springs near it. Like, I just wanna say that it's, it's not just the emotional value of the tree. It really is, like, it, it really is doing its part to uphold that hillside um, and removing it will cause other issues that we won't really be able to address in, in one easy go, like it's, I just wanted to make that clear that, that that is like a real problem from removing the tree. Thank you. Thank you very much. The person who was online, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, certainly. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Deborah Seche, and I live in Santa Cruz. I uh, wasn't planning to comment, but I was very impressed by the applicant's presentation. I thought he made some really good points. And I, I really think we should consider a few things. You know, one is that this tree is healthy. It's not diseased. And the fact that it's capturing CO2 is an important benefit to humans that we should not um, discount lightly. And I agree that we should really study the hillside to understand the impact of cutting down this tree. Um, this sounds like this root system is really important. It's holding up the hillside. It's, it's absorbing water. Um, I think maybe cutting this tree down now without understanding that impact would be short-sighted. And I agree that we could mitigate the sidewalk damage. That's a lot of things people have already suggested, especially if the city can help financially. I don't believe it should be totally on the responsibility of the property owner. 
but I do agree that we should slow down and consider the options before we destroy this um, beautiful and important tree. Thank you for your comments. Anyone else with us in chambers wish me comment? Anyone else online? Ms. Bush? Mr. Franson, this be your opportunity to take up to five minutes uh, in terms of rebuttal or conclusions you'd like to present to us. Thank you, everyone, to thank you to everyone who spoke. You guys all said amazing things. I'm very proud of all of you. Um, one thing that I really wanted to mention earlier that slipped my mind was, um, you know, in the in the write up um, by Arborist, it mentions uh, root pruning and how that's like not feasible because it's too close to the apartment. But nowhere in it does it mention apartment pruning. And I do think that the loss of a small part of one unit in a 19 unit building um, really is, uh, you know, um, negligible compared to the loss of this giant tree. And um, as, you know, if the building needs to be amended or, you know, rebuilt uh, this corner in a different way, that, you know, that is, that's a big deal. Um, but it's something that will probably have to be done for the future of this building anyway. Um, I also want to mention I think just about every existing giant redwood tree downtown Santa Cruz is in the proximity to a building that eventually it's going to get up close to it. They grow huge. They don't really stop. And um, I just want to say, like, if if they're all going to be um, a threat to buildings, then might as well get rid of them now. It's cheaper, you know. If we're if we're trying to uh, you know cut costs, let's get rid of all of them. Um, I think these giant uh, trees in downtown are. Um, you know, worth it. We all know that. We all like them. They're all beautiful. Um, so in conclusion, we urge you to consider the broader implications of removing this tree. It's not just about one tree. It's about our neighborhood, our environment, our economy, and our commitment to a sustainable future. Let us come together to find the alternate solution that allows us to protect this special nat natural asset. Together, we can make a difference for today and the many, many generations that come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Beck, uh, this is going to be uh, uh, your opportunity to uh, respond to points raised by the appellant if uh, those are in order. I would just offer a couple points of clarification regarding the volume of permits and the outcome of those. Uh, that question was raised at our Parks and Recreation Commission meeting in August and we are preparing an information report on the um, permits that have been issued in the last year, how many were approved, how many were denied. And I'll also say that you know, the permit process is the formal way in which we resolve these issues. Often our urban forester will have informal dialogue with people before the actual permit process begins, um, rather than tell someone to you know, spend their money just to be told that they're not gonna get to move forward with something. So the uh, numbers won't actually tell the whole story uh, and then just to, to clarify, um, one of the speakers uh, mentioned the ratio of one tree being removed, or 4,000 trees being removed over time to three being planted. Just wanted to make sure we were all clear on the statistics. In each individual tree that's removed, we ask for three smaller trees or one large tree to be replanted. Um, and our last year we planted 300, over 300 trees as a department, and our goal is to plant 3,000 in the next seven to eight years. Thank you, sir. Matters back before the council. Council member, excuse me, council member Newsom. I'm going to recognize you. Uh, glad, Mr. Brown. I'd like to like to make a motion to uh, accept the recommended action. Make your motion. What is your motion? I didn't hear you. Uh, to accept the recommended action. Okay. There's a motion. Is there a second? I'll second the motion. Under discussion, Mr. Newsom. Open on your motion. Uh, thank you, Mayor Keeley, and I want to um, thank all of those who came out uh, today to uh, talk in support of uh, the appeal. Uh, and I, uh, I really want to thank you for your public engagement, um, or for being publicly engaged. Uh, this is not an action or a decision that I take uh, lightly or, or enjoy. Uh, however, uh, uh, the tree is um, adversely affecting a public right of way and a, a private building. Uh, and it's also creating a liability issue, and the tree is also um, 
We've also had two uh, professional arborists who have gone out and looked at the tree and have um, come to the conclusion that any possible mitigation effects of pruning the, um, uh, the root system would uh, very negatively affect uh, the um, uh, health of the tree. Uh, so uh, it's, it's not an uh, action that I take lightly or enjoy doing, uh, but I um, support the recommended action. Uh, and I am glad that there are mitigation effects that Mr. Beck has talked about of planting three trees for one tree being removed. Uh, and I also look forward to working with uh, my colleagues uh, and the staff on um, bolstering our downtown urban forest and provi provi providing more resources to bolster our downtown urban forest and uh, plant more trees in downtown and in um, my district as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I had intended to make a motion to delay the decision on this and um, to ask the staff to um, return with some additional information. Um, since I wasn't able to make that motion, I'm going to make some comments here about why I will be opposing this motion. Um, first, with res and I and I appreciate the the rationale that Councilmember Newsom you've given, uh, and I care about those things too. I'm very concerned about um, liability and um, you know potential loss of housing and and many of the things that that you've discussed here, and and certainly the safety of uh, of people who are um, trying to navigate our streets. Um, <clears throat> however. I am, and I'm not going to repeat all the arguments that were made, but I want to just share a couple of points. I am persuaded, um, and I think, as I think we all should be persuaded, um, on the scientific evidence about the potential carbon capture of a large mature tree. The replacement mitigation trees, um, I'm not going to even try to do a back of the envelope, even though I'm tempted, um, but um, not in any of our lifetimes will those replacement trees come close to the carbon capture of this mature tree. Not even if it's three to one, not even close in our entire lifetimes, all of us in this room. So um, it's, it, it's not sufficient to me, um, and I, I appreciate it, um, but it's not sufficient to me to warrant uh, taking this tree down. Second, I um, am persuaded by the morphology arguments that have been made here. I teach landscape morphology, I study it, and I understand uh, what we look at slope and uh, we look at elevation and we look at slope and we think about how water moves underground and I am persuaded based upon what I know of that slope and I was out there yesterday, I went all around, I you know, looked at things um, myself and stood on that um, uh, at both you know both angles both elevations to and and that there will be significant problems underground if this tree is removed and those and those roots rot um, and it will be an ongoing battle it will cost more money over time to try to contend with that so I am persuaded um, for scientific reasons that the cost that if we're really concerned about cost we should not remove this tree Third, I am persuaded that the useful life of the building is, mitigates against the concern for, about um, potential structural damage. I do not believe that, I have not heard that of anything, and I have not read anything here. There seem to be different interpretations of it, but I do not see anything suggesting that the structural damage will make this building uninhabitable um, in the amount of time that that building has left in its useful life. And um, so, I think it could just be, and we could figure out the street, um, the issues, and, and I believe it's in the public interest for us to do that, um, even if it costs more money. And so my recommendation was going to be, um, and I am afraid that this is likely to be, um, you know, one more um, uh, efficacious move uh, here on, on the part of the city. Um, I have a little bit of an emotional attachment to the tree, but not really. I mean, what I have is an understanding that um, making the most a seemingly expeditious position, t a decision in the moment um, certainly isn't always in the public interest. And in this case, I don't believe is in the interest of the property owner, because what happens after this is going to have much more significant um, challenges. It's, it's going to create those challenges, particularly if we have you know, 
don't do it before the next El Nino. <laughs> um, so I, um, and I believe it's worth the cost. Hang on, okay, hold on just a second. Uh, where we are is we have finished your testimony and everyone else's testimony. This, uh, no, excuse me. This is back before the council. Okay. I'm not going to recognize I, you. Not be I not about that. anything other than. It just seems that a third no, option. No, no. Excuse has come me. Up. Excuse me. Ms. Brown. At the end of my comments, I'll. I'd love to hear another option because if there's anything we can do to save this tree, I want that. I want to have that conversation. Um, my my motion was going to be to ask the staff to come back and and to do some additional analysis exploration of alternatives and come back to us um, with the potential cost. Um, it's not going to be $10,000. It's going to be quite a bit more than that. Um, but perhaps a, a budget adjustment. I think it's worth it in this case to consider all the options before we make this decision. Um, and, and that's the motion I would have made. Um, I'll, so, okay, I'll make it as a substitute motion. Bonnie, can you put up my motion? I'm going to make a substitute motion. I'm not used to getting a second on things like this. Sure. Pretty simple. Please state your motion. My motion is to accept the appeal. Um, well, actually, we can just take this out uh, part. We can just not make a decision if you don't want to accept the appeal. My motion was to accept the appeal and deny the Parks and Rec Commission's approval of a tree removal permit application submitted by Santa Cruz Property Management to remove one coastal redwood tree at 339 Walnut Avenue, and two, to direct staff to conduct additional analysis and explore alternatives to tree removal to return to council with potential mitigation measures, a cost estimate for sidewalk repair, and possible budget adjustment. There is a motion. I'll is second. there a second? There's a I'll motion second. and a second under discussion. Ms. Brown. So, well, that's that. I mean, I, I, I tried to keep it simple. I think there's a lot of ideas have come up here about conversations that could be had with the property owner, um, with other experts. Um, and so I, I certainly am, am open to massaging this or, um, you know, filling in, but I wanted to just keep it simple um, to express the intention that we want to find another way forward. And I will just finally say, I will start the GoFundMe <laughs> when this meeting ends. The vice mayor is recognized and you. So and vice I have to say, when I came into the meeting after seeing the pictures, I thought it was a pretty obvious needing to be removed situation. But I have to really applaud the appellant and the young people who grew up here um, and your thoughtfulness of your arguments, they really persuaded me to think differently. Um, I also went to Santa Cruz High. I would park right there by the tree. I also, the thing that I thought when I saw the pictures is like if somebody was on a we in a wheelchair, how are they going to navigate that space? Um, I agree that I don't think redwood trees are great street trees. Um, <laughs> and, but in this circumstance, given everything that we've heard, I feel like it, I, I don't know, if denying it right now would mean there's no opportunity for future removal, or is it can we postpone it and, and analyze it more? Because I think there's some other options. And I just, you know, the useful life of most buildings, sorry, we're not Europe, is less than, I don't know, 100 years, maybe, sorry, maybe not your house, but many houses <laughs> around here, 100 years. And so if the building's 75 years old, I when the speaker said, like to see the building torn down in 30 years and the tree gone, it just seems like heartbreaking to me. Um, and, you know, just, every, I won't repeat everything that the speaker said, but they really did um, persuade me to think differently about this and not just do the ministerial thing that we normally do. Ontario Johnson. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes. Councilmember Brown, we were maybe like having some telepathy because I had written the same, almost the same exact motion. So thank you for making that. And um, Councilmember Newsom, I also understand the points that you brought up. They are real concerns, um, but I do think a pause here is worthwhile. Um, I'm not ready to give up on this tree. I, I would like to spend some more time to um, see how we can work with the property managers. I don't want it to fall just on, uh, excuse me, the property owners um, to address this. So. Um, I also have real concern about the unintended consequences of removing of the tree. 
I don't know anything about trees. I'm not an arborist. I'm not an engineer. But I'm curious to find out what the data and the research shows. Um, so I was going to not support the previous motion. I, obviously, I seconded this, and, and I'm in support of taking a pause, doing some more analysis, and see what we can do um, to, to save the tree, address the sidewalk issue, prioritize. I guess that's the other language that I had that's different, is the prioritization of fixing of the sidewalk. I don't know if we could fit that into your so friendly amendment to. Where would you like to place that? Yeah, I'm looking to see. Uh, maybe it's a 1A. Prioritization of fixing of the sidewalk. Agreeable to you, yeah. the maker of the motion. Yeah. The second. Well, you are the second, so I'll take. Uh, Agreeable to me. You would agree yes. With yourself. Yeah. So, and and thank you for everyone who um, came out here and spoke online. Um, your arguments were very compelling. Thank you. Let's just hold here for a second while the clerk gets the language that that you want in here. Yes. Direct staff to prioritize fixing the impacted sidewalk. I realize that more needs to go into that, and we need to figure out how to do it right. But so that would be one A, I think, or I, I don't know where I would. <laughs> yeah, it could be three. Uh, Councilmember Kalantari Johnson, if I may clarify, just to make sure we have a full understanding of your intent, there you're not directing staff to fix the sidewalk at this point in time, correct? But to come back with cost estimates and potential options for doing so yeah i mean there's a lot that's going to happen in this and so the fixing of the sidewalk should, i would like that to be prior or looking at how we fix the sidewalk to be prioritized among all of the other pieces there's a fire hydrant there's a structure there's all of that but prioritizing the fixing of the sidewalk as we're looking at the budget let's, that? Hold, let's hold for just a second i like where the city manager is going with that by way of clarification let's make sure the clerk has got that I mean, I threw something that, that could be a placeholder, is but Johnson, is, that, is that a does that work? Agreeable? Could I suggest, sir, directing staff to explore options for prioritizing fixing the impacted sidewalk? Just kind of restating it to be extra clear. Okay, that works. Okay, work that work for you. Okay, and thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Ms. Watkins. Yeah. Thank you. Um, well, I mean, I'll just say these decisions are never easy. Having sat um, here and looking at our policy and being in a public hearing setting and weighing the evidence, it, it, it never makes these choices easy. And we all love our redwood trees and are attached to them and um, also are um, presented with evidence, right? I'll wait for <laughs> your phone to stop ringing. Um, I want to thank everybody who came and spoke. I just relate, and I also want to acknowledge uh, the individual who's visually Im impaired who brought this forward. This is not on you. This is much more complex, and I'm sorry for your experience. Um, I guess my, my question is, what additional evidence could be examined that hasn't already been examined if moving forward with this alternative motion. And maybe that's you, Tony, I don't know who that is. That's an interesting question. Um, it occurs to me as the council is discussing potential options for um, fixing the sidewalk that under our code, the maintenance of the sidewalk is the responsibility of adjacent property owner. So that is something that we would be working with the property owner to, uh, to obtain uh, I think you have two issues there. One is the integrity of the building, and one is the integrity of the sidewalk. And I think both are at play here. Um, I suppose that the direction would entail seeking yet another expert opinion. And, and I think just thinking back to Councilmember Brown's comments earlier, um, really it's, it's likely to boil down to a question of cost. And, and what is an acceptable cost to, to uh, put uh, on the burden of the property owner uh, toward. Um, and I don't know what additional information is out there, but that would be what would have to be explored. Okay. 
I'm not quite finished yet, sure. but if no, no, I just want to pull the question. Okay. Okay. I guess my um, so then I appreciate I appreciate that. Um, I am concerned that we will probably receive what we've currently received in terms of the evidence we've been presented. Maybe that's not the case, and and in which case I'll be pleasantly surprised. I think that for me, where I struggle with all of these decisions is how the policy is written, how the evidence is presented to us, and then the findings are established. And if it were just a sidewalk repair, I don't think it would be here before us. Mm -hmm. It's the structural integrity of the building. And frankly, I have concerns about our liability. And I, you know, I don't know, Tony, if you, you feel comfortable Mic check. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, thank you to the appellant for being here, and thank you to the property owners and for everyone speaking. This is, um, you know, I've only been involved with a few of these heritage tree removal requests, and, it, you know, in this case, this is a healthy tree, and um, you know, I, I don't think that, um, you know, we have to weigh so many factors here, but I don't feel that my decision can be made without complete data. And the only data that's been presented is the option for tree removal versus any data on the home and the structure and options there. And who knows, that might be less expensive than the property owner having to repair the sidewalk and remove the tree. I don't know because that data has not been fully um, looked into. And, and if it has, I did ask the question. It hasn't been presented. And so, you know, my initial thought was to make a motion to delay so that more data could be um, um, kind of looked at in terms of creative options to it's the tree and the structure. I am pro saving those 18 homes. The tree doesn't need saving. It's the structure that needs saving if if there's you know potential danger to the 18 homes that are there. And so the other part of it is 
whether or not the tree comes or goes, the structure in danger or not, the sidewalk needs to be repaired and that is the responsibility of the adjacent property. And so that does need to be prioritized. And if there is, um, you know, I know this is a, a, perhaps an issue across the city for many property owners to be um, uh, burdened with that. I, I um, So if there is a fund or grants or options of you know, I encourage city staff to work with the property owners on getting that sidewalk fixed, um, regardless of any decision here, because it, we've already had someone hurt, and um, I would, it would just be um, really sad to have any more injuries in that regard. So if there's any way that there is any option to support in that heritage tree fund or any of the in lieu um, fee funds that could help if that's needed for the property owners to repair the sidewalk let's get that done and um you know i don't know what this substitute motion i appreciate it um i do feel like i wouldn't be able to support a decision today because the data is not there to to make a decision to remove this tree that's not, that can't be the only option. And if it is, there's no data saying that is the only option. So I can't, I can't make that decision today. So my question, I guess, uh, uh, you know, delaying or accepting what puts the liability now on the city? I mean, that's another factor that was brought up by Council Member Watkins. Um, and again, that's then another factor for this body to consider. All of a sudden, now it's the city's liability if we take any certain action. And so that's kind of a hard place to be in. Um, I am pro-tree, pro-housing, <laughs> pro-homes for people. So how do we do both and how do we get that data and some real expert, and then there's so many opinions given I have my opinions too, but I need facts and data. Um, you know, there were suggestions about maybe this, maybe that, but those are all nothing's factual data to to say, hey, we could do this to the structure, and you know, to save the tree, we could. I, the structure is the big thing for me. The sidewalk has to be replaced, has to be repaired, and. Um, you know, the fire hydrant, that seemed minor down the line, yes. The tree roots will still continue to grow. It might have to be replaced again, yes. But this is a healthy tree as per the, the report. So um, how, do we, how do we get there to make this informed decision with data? Council Member Newsom. Uh, thank you, Mayor Keeley. Um, I'll kind of echo just the sentiments of my colleague, uh, Council Member Watkins. I, I, and I, I'm very conflicted by this motion. I, I would, I would like to save this tree. I would like to have the tree be there, but there are also concerns about its impact on the structural integrity of the building, along with the sidewalk that we focused on. But there is the impact that it's having on the structural integrity of the building, or will eventually have on the structural integrity of the building. And the tree does sit on private property, so. It's, it's hard to see if we sit back and, and look at more options that could possibly happen, you know, w will that change the approach? Possibly, maybe not, but, you know, there's, to me, there's just concerns uh, with that that's, that's taking place with the building. Councilmember Brown. Thank you. I'm trying to remember what my follow, I had a follow-up question from Councilmember Watkins, and I'm, I'm trying to remember, I should have written it down. Um, the... But since liability has become the talking point, I'll I'll go to that. Um, in terms of the the question of liability, my understanding is if we deny an appeal or we if we support an appeal and, and deny the application, then the city takes on liability for injuries in this in that case, and that's the concern that if, if you've got. If a permit is applied for to correct a dangerous condition and the city denies the permit then the property owner is not liable for injuries caused by the dangerous condition. Otherwise, under state law, 
if it's a city sidewalk that exists as a dangerous condition, the city may be liable for that. And that could be true in either case? The, ci the city's liability? It, there is a liability component. The way the city has avoided liability is by having an ordinance that transfers liability for dangerous conditions of city sidewalks caused by the property the adjacent property property owners failure to maintain their sidewalk uh, onto the property owner by the way the obligation to maintain the sidewalk is not just a city requirement it's a requirement of state law as well so the the local ordinance piece is the transfer of liability and the and the ability for the city to be indemnified for a dangerous condition so, so I, I have a little bit of a concern both about potential dangerous condition of the sidewalk and potential damage to the building uh, were the tree to remain in place um, and cause further damage to the building. So now, my that, that's not to say that the council can't direct that additional research be done into potential viability of retaining the tree. I would note there are two arborists' opinions in your packet that's, that indicate that that is um, that root pruning or other measures designed to protect the sidewalk and the building are not feasible for this tree. Um, the council could ask for additional research to support that opinion or to refute it. And so that's the direction that I'm hearing um, this motion is intended to take. Actually, I, I want to be clear <laughs> about what my intention is here, that, that there is other data that could help us weigh this decision. Getting one more, you know, getting, you know, Lewis and then Davey and, you know, every arborist, um, you know, under the sun to use the same methodology and look at the same questions, we quite likely will get the same answers. I'm talking about other factors and the potential for alternatives to removal. Right? It's not about just asking for a, a, another person to do the same study. It's about getting additional information about, um, you know, the 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 I guess the the overall picture. And I so I have a follow up question then about liability, because what I'm hearing is that um, really this this tree uh, removal uh, application came at the behest of the city, and um, so the city is really drive has driven it thus far, if. Uh, the tree is removed, and then um, due to what geomorphologists know <laughs> is likely to be true, um, there is further damage to the structure. What liability does the city have in that case? If we have directed a tree be removed, it's removed, and then a sinkhole forms underneath a building um, with some cracks in the structure, um, and further damage is done, a washout, for example, um, what liability does the city have? So I guess my, my response to that, council member, is that uh, I think the sequence of events is that the condition of the sidewalk was brought to the city's attention by the speaker, and the city likely in turn brought it to the attention of the property owner, who then applied for a permit for permission to remove the tree. I don't think the city at any point uh, would uh, deny an application for an encroachment permit to maintain the, or repair the sidewalk, which is really the only the city's interest as far as this application is concerned. So, so back around to that question, um, I believe that um, the city taking on some liability for this might give us the incentive to actually find an alternative and do that in a, in a timely manner. And so I'm going to continue to support <laughs> this uh, approach. Um, we'll see what others have to say. Thanks. Member Watkins. Um, I don't know if I have much more to add other than that in the agenda report, it mentions the evidence that's presented in the standards by kind of best standard for arboriculture's formula for root pruning. So I think that, I think in terms of the evidence consideration, the standard to meet our criteria for our policy has been as examined, right? And so for me, I think when you look, maybe the question at some point is around the policy and how we examine the policy, but the liability, the criteria for me is pr pretty clear. Mm -hmm. So 
unfortunately, I don't feel like I can support the motion <laughs> given those considerations. Councilmember Bruner. So um, the, for me, the evidence and the data um, for alternatives, I feel like the data is all about the tree. And there's no, there's not, a, and I don't know if it's emphasized enough in this motion, but there's not enough data about the structure. And so that to me is, is key in this decision before making a decision like this. Um, yeah. Further debate or discussion? Seen and hung, seen and hear none. Kelly, may I ask a question? Excuse me, yes, sir. Um, just to clarifying the intent of the motion on the floor and how that would work procedurally, because um, I'm hearing two things. If the desire is to do further study and um, investigate the issue further, then I'm not sure if the first portion of the motion wants to be in there or if there's a way to reframe that to delay hearing of it. Let me ask, let me ask uh, Mr. Gandotti, instead of this, could it be continue consideration of an appeal on whatever and then move through the rest of the motion? Because yes. it seems like what the council wants is additional information in order to make this decision. Uh, continue the hearing and direct staff to return. Any objection to that? Any objection here? Any objection? Okay, I just want to make sure as to language. All right, so let's make sure that the so, clerk has. So then, Bonnie, sure. you can just delete the rest of that first paragraph. And uh, while you're doing that, let me ask, continue to a date certain? How much time do you think you might need on this? Uh, we'll have to work with both public works and the property owners, so minimum of 90 days, six months, maybe more realistic. Let's do this. Let's go 90 days, and if you need an extension, you can come. You can ask for that at the at the uh, agenda committee. All right. Let's. You, we'll put a number in there. We'll try to manage towards that. If not, we can we can continue. Mr. Condotti, is that all right? Work. With yes, you? that's fine. Okay. Any objection to that on the table? So. Procedurally here, what you have is a motion, to, uh, a substitute motion. So the yes. council will be voting yes. on whether to accept the motion. Right. If it passes, then you can vote on the motion. Yep. Can I ask a clarifying question? You just did. Go ahead. Ask another one. <laughs> can I ask another question? <laughs> Tony, during the continuum portion of the time, is that where does that fall in terms of potential liability if it's six months and there could be an incident that occurs? Uh, that's something we'll have to give some serious thought to, given the condition of the sidewalk. All debate having ceased, we will vote on whether or not to accept the substitute motion. Clerk will call the roll. Council members Newsom? No. <clears throat> Brown? Aye. Watkins? No. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. We are, uh, we've accepted that motion. Now we will, if I understand it procedurally, that erases the underlying motion. We will now vote on the motion in chief. Clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? No. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. We are on item 12. This is the Downtown Association Parking and Business Improvement Area Assessment for fiscal year 2024. We have presentation, Ms. Unit. Here. Okay. Oops. Okay. <laughs> we'll make it 30. Okay, you got it. Thank you. What? 
No. We will in a few minutes, but go ahead. Go, go. We got a quorum sitting here. Okay. Okay. Okay, let's take the conversations outside, please. Excuse me. Take your conversations outside, please. Please take those outside. Thank you. Ms. Unit, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, Rebecca Unit, Economic Development Manager. Um, I'm here today for uh, the public hearing portion uh, to consider the um, increase assessment for the Downtown Association Business uh, Improvement District. Um, this is for fiscal year 2024 for the January assessment. Uh, so this assessment is on business owners. This is actually an assessment that's brought forward by the businesses in the downtown area. Um, the Downtown Association is the organization that um, administers this assessment. Um, so it's not brought forward by the city. We just administer the collection of it. Um, so. Uh, the process for this is uh, to review the ballots that we've collected, tabulate the votes um, for and against uh, this increased assessment. Um, and so following public comment, um, we will proceed to that counting and come back with the results um, and determine uh, the next steps for the motion for you today. I'll welcome any questions. Thank you. Questions, comments to Ms. Unit. Thank you, Ms. Unit. We appreciate that. What we will do at this time because the city clerk needs to count those ballots and return and tell us what the outcome of the counts, counting of those ballots is. We will take a 30 minute break at this time. Um, confirm we need public comment first. Public comment first. Public comment first. And we'll break. Glad to hear public comment on this item. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi, my name is Jackie Truitt, and I am the owner of Super Silver and Golden Bliss in downtown Santa Cruz. Um, <clears throat> I'm here to oppose the bill of the 15% increase. I do believe that the downtown needs more money to clean up the downtown. So my suggestion is a 10% increase. Um, and really, what I wanted to be here today to say is I want to make sure my money is going to the right places. Right now, after 6 p.m., we have a complete lack of law enforcement downtown. Sorry, I'm shaking. I'm not. You're doing great. I'm not good at publicly speaking. OK. <laughs> so um, we have a lack of officers down there. We don't have any um, of the downtown association at 530. They're off. Businesses are open late. Restaurants are open late. We need the downtown to be a safe environment. I am suggesting that with this money, Instead of using it for advertising, because that's what's stated in it, is one of the things they want to use the money for. In my mind, I said it doesn't matter how much we advertise. If the downtown isn't safe, people don't want to bring their kids down here. I have two children. I moved from the west side to Scotts Valley. Everyone that I know, all the moms and all the fathers, all the parents, no one wants to bring their kids to downtown. So that's what I want to see change. I would like to see the business owner's money going towards that and protecting our employees and making sure it's safe for them to get to their cars. I would like to see a new unit implemented that can deal with the mental health that is downtown. And I would like to see those people off of Pacific Avenue. My life was threatened two weeks ago. The response by the officer was unacceptable to me. And that is not the type of town I want to be in. I am a local. I was born in Dominican Hospital. I have worked downtown for 27 years. And I want to see it cleaned up. And I want to see a nicer environment for a community. I also would like to see my money go towards helping the parking for the employees. It was raised twice this year, from 55 to 65 to 75. These employees, these college students, cannot afford to pay $75 a month when their rent is getting increased and the cost of food has gone up. We need to make it reasonable for them to come to work, and it's getting harder to hire people. So my suggestion is that we reduce that to a $25 monthly fee instead of the $75. People can pay that. That still gives the city a little bit of money to pay for the cards or whatever they need to do. But that's what I would like to see. I want to see downtown cleaned up, and I want to make sure the money is going in the right spot. And I do want to mention this, which I've never been to these hearings before, so maybe this should have been brought up in the beginning. 
We did take on another program over the last couple of years, which is the sidewalk vending. That program costs our city $264,000 a year, and I want to know where they got the money to pay for that. Because did that come from our ranger program that we had to stop two years ago? Because that's my concern. And then asking a business to then pay for new programs when we already were, I just want to make sure our money is going to the right spot. So I'm, I'm here, and um, thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much. Let me, see, uh, please, others who wish to testify, come on up. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you. My name is Robert. I'm a native of Santa Cruzan. I'm a property owner downtown, and I am all for improving the downtown area. I think that there's great opportunity for us to do a better job. Number one is hygiene and cleanliness. If you look at the uh, gardening of downtown and how we maintain that compared to property uh, owners or a good example is the Seaside Company. If you go down Beach Street, it's immaculate. The plants are maintained. The garden's maintained. It's an environment that people want to come and enjoy. And Santa Cruz is special. It always has been, but it's deteriorating. We are in decay. The downtown area is not being properly maintained. The safety issues that this lady mentioned. But I'm also concerned about um, the maintenance of downtown. So please take that into consideration in, in your approving of this. I think that there has to be somebody responsible for that, and there has to be a, a group of individuals that maintain that and take pride of it and are held accountable for it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, before we, uh, do we have anyone online, Ms. Bush? No. Okay. Anyone else who wishes to testify? Good afternoon. Hello, council members. Thank you all for your service to our city. I appreciate all of you and what you all do. Um, I'm here to speak on uh, behalf of many of the board members of the Downtown Association who uh, proposed this levy increase. The board is unanimously in favor of this increase and includes many business owners of places you might know, like Yoso Wellness Spa, the Penny Ice Creamery, Santa Cruz Community Credit Union, Farmers Insurance, Pona Hawaiian Grill, Minnow Arts, Space Camp Design Build, Google, Ecology Action, Pacific Cookie Company, Oswald, Pipeline. Um, we have a great board. I appreciate my volunteer board. Um, and they're also elected by the 550 downtown businesses who will be affected by this increase. And I really appreciate Jackie showing up to speak on her own behalf. Um, but I also wanted to speak for these um, business owners and the dozens of business owners who I've heard from who feel like um, now is the time. It's been 30 years since this assessment structure has changed. Um, downtown uh, is fortunate that we've seen more businesses now open than closed during the pandemic. Um, and we're about to see some major growth with thousands of new uh, residences downtown that are also going to impact all of the services that we need to provide. So we really appreciate all of the council's um, support for downtown um, and the ability to allow the businesses to continue to contribute to our community through this assessment. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else who's with us today? Seeing, hearing none. Public comment. We are going to take a break between now and 535 in order for the clerk to complete your work in tabulating the results of the election in the assessment district. Will that give you sufficient time? Okay, we'll take a 30-minute break. We will return here at 535. <laughs>
look to Ms. Unit to uh, announce the results of the tabulations. Ms. Unit. Thank you. Uh, so for this assessment to pass, uh, for the increase to be approved, we have to receive uh, no more than 50% no votes. And so we only received 4.5% no votes. Um, so the increase uh, has been approved by the members of the um, assessment district. Uh, so I would like to ask that the council move the staff recommendation. Staff recommendation includes adoption of a resolution confirming the annual plan and levying the appropriate assessments and adopt ordinance number 2023-11 confirming chapter 5.05 of the municipal code and related actions. Is there a motion in that regard? I'll move it. Motion here, second by Ms. Contari Johnson. The motion, Ms. Uh, Ms. Bush, was by uh, by Ms. Watkins. Motion by Watkins, second by Contari Johnson. Is there debate or discussion on the motion? Seeing, hearing none. The clerk will call the roll. Council members Newsom, aye. Brown, aye. Watkins, aye. Contari Johnson, aye. Um, I will note Councilmember Bruner is still um, had recused herself on this yes. item, so she's not voting. Uh, Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and it's ordered. We're, before we depart, I just want to say, I, I, uh, the person who testified, um, I don't think you're going to get anybody up here disagreeing with the need to continue to improve safety and other issues downtown. I do think what we might also add to that is that we feel like it is trending in the right direction. I think we see reductions in homelessness because of some work we've done. We've seen reduction in some of the property crimes. I think there's some improvement, but you're right. We, we've got to keep doing that, trending in the right direction. So thank you for coming and articulating your view. We're on item 13, West Cliff update, including infrastructure, transportation, regulatory planning, and roadmap development, Ms. Schmidt. I believe is here on this item, but if not, who shall we hear from? Do you have an idea? Anyone wish to present on this item, staff level? Good afternoon. <laughs> good evening, <laughs> sir. <laughs> good afternoon, <laughs> Mayor, <laughs> Council Members, Nathan Wen, Director of Public Works. Of our assistant city manager will also be joining us um, when she's available. Um, <clears throat> so tonight we have an item before you to bring forth the, the uh, 50 year vision of uh, the roadmap. Um, we have a PowerPoint deck, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> before you that uh, today we have our consultant team, Fairland Strategies will give us an update on this 50 year vision work. Um, I will follow up with an update with regards to our infrastructure updates and then we'll close with some next steps. Ms. Schmidt, uh, uh, Ms. Schmidt, come on up. I know, I know we're all running around it's late in the evening or at least the afternoon. I know we we're all spread around a little bit uh, during the break. So Ms. Schmidt, thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you, Mayor. My apologies for that. Nathan did the introductions. Thank you so much. And um, we are very excited to give you the latest updates on Westcliff and I will Hand it over to Michael McCormick from Farallon Strategies. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council. Pleasure to be here. Um, or I guess maybe it's almost evening. Good evening. So you've had a long day today. Uh, so we do have an update on Westcliff and some of the work that's going to be happening over the next couple of months. Um, and then uh, staff is also going to provide a summary of uh, some of the things that are in process uh, as well uh, out on Westcliff. So we go to the next slide. Um, we have a busy fall and winter ahead of us. Um, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about today uh, the, rec the uh, recap on some of the roadmap work, which is you know, looking at the prioritizations of projects and policies uh, that apply to Westcliff. And then um, we're going to talk a little bit about the interagency collaboration that has uh, started in response to the council's direction and some uh, recent engagement with federal and state partners. Uh, Public Works uh, will be providing an update as well, uh, and then the local coastal program update. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the 50-year vision uh, as directed by the council uh, staff and the consultant team have been moving forward 
uh, on uh, developing that vision and ensuring that the public has multiple opportunities to engage, advise, and influence that, that vision. Um, so I'm gonna share a little bit more about that plan. So next slide. So uh, the roadmap itself, uh, this came before you uh, a few uh, months back from year zero to four, zero to three time frame, right? These are the very short near-term projects that are largely already in process. Um, and we needed to take a look at I, how they applied in this current context of Westcliff and the disasters that occurred in December and January. And um, those, so those came before you for consideration. We also are queuing up and starting to prioritize those four-year-plus projects and policies as well. There's hundreds of policies and projects that apply in Westcliff right now. And recognizing the importance of having those projects and policies reflect longer-term visioning um, and this kind of real-world dynamic that we're living in um, on the roadmap, uh, you know, the narrative around the dynamic coast, uh, we're looking at those uh, prioritized projects as well, using uh, much the same criteria that we looked at for projects zero through three. Um, we're cl collaborating closely with city staff to assess and evaluate these projects. They are going to be digging in and rolling up their sleeves with us. You know, there is uh, the ideal scenario of, hey, these are the best projects and policies we could apply out there in any particular given situation. Um, and then there's the real world limitations of how do we actually do that? We have to also be pragmatic. So considering costs, considering the real world environmental conditions on Westcliff, uh, considering the regulatory dynamic that we operate in. And you all have uh, heard quite a bit about some of the regulatory uh, process and protocols that we've had to apply on projects moving forward out on Westcliff. And so concurrent of the development of, those, uh, of this 50 year vision that we've been directed to develop, uh, we're also looking at these projects and policies because we wanna make sure that these hundreds of projects and policies that the city has on the books are also helping to achieve that longer term vision. So what you'll be seeing later this year come before you is a, a comprehensive look at uh, the portfolio of, of projects, the portfolio of policies that are currently on the books and lining that up with the vision for uh, five decades in the future of what uh, Westcliff uh, may look like at, at that point and how uh, the community sees Westcliff functioning and, and operating in 50 years. So uh, next slide. And in order to do this, um, uh, in order to do the engagement on the roadmap, uh, so far we've done uh, four outreach meetings and workshops. Uh, we've had multiple engagements here uh, with all of you. Uh, and we had a, a wonderful, uh, and I would say fun and enjoyable uh, work session uh, in a, a month and a half or so ago as well on the vision and trying to ground ourselves in uh, what does that 50 year vision look like? And, and some of your early thoughts and the folks that were in, in attendance, early thoughts on, on that longer term vision and uh, uh, thinking through some top level um, kind of newspaper article concepts and themes that we might want to see uh, or we might see in 50 years, whether we want to see them or not. Uh, so next slide. And uh, this, the roadmap that was developed uh, has uh, gone out. We we've, uh, understand from a number of uh, public folks that have engaged with us through this, this review process, there's a few hundred downloads that have occurred of the document. So people are reading it. Uh, they, uh, we've received a number of comments on it. So in addition to um, the update to include the three, four year plus projects beyond the zero to three that we've already prioritized, uh, we'll also be factoring in those comments that we've received on this document as well. Um, so you'll be seeing that come back before you in the near future. Next slide. So an update on the interagency progress. Um, so the council back uh, a couple months ago has uh, provided direction to staff and the, and the consultant team to engage with our state and federal interagency. Um, uh, staff was very much on the same page as this thought process. So back in March, coming right after these disasters, we recognized a need um, to uh, help activate that state and federal interagency work. And so we did a, a, an application to what's called the Silver Jacket. So if you go to the next slide. And the Silver Jackets is an interagency federal and state working group. We've talked a little bit about it at, other, at prior council meetings, um, but we were recently issued uh, an approval uh, of supporting approval of that engagement and the focus will be on nature-based solutions. It'll be starting in January formally across 
the state and federal agency. We're still scoping out what that engagement looks like, but it'll basically stand up a, uh, a multiple agency task force to help us talk through some of the challenging things to come um, out of this vision. So once we've established the vision that comes before you later this year and in January, you'll also be uh, having this uh, great state and federal interagency working group who I've worked with in the past. Um, they can be really valuable if they have a focused work plan that they're working through. And the end result will be um, helping us, uh, as, us as the city, the royal us, uh, answer uh, some, some of the questions about how the federal and state interagency can engage with the city on accomplishing some of the, the larger goals and the longer term goals that will be outlined in that vision. So next. So I'm going to hand it over uh, to Nathan now to give a little bit of an update on um, what's happening out on Westcliff. Good evening, uh, Mayor, Council Members, Nathan, my Director of Public Works. <clears throat> we just have one slide for you tonight with regards to our Public Works update. And so with regards to the efforts on the infill walls, uh, we have gotten to contract with Grand Construction based on our last uh, meeting with you a meeting with council uh, and doing a budget adjustment. Right now we are reviewing the submittals. Uh, the temporary traffic control plan has been approved, but we are reviewing a shoring plan that they've submitted. So we are uh, waiting to get that approved before they actually can go out and perform the work. We hope to have that approved sometime this week, maybe early next week. So you'll, we'll be seeing those granite crooks out there uh, very soon. <clears throat> Um, we installed some additional um, temporary traffic control measures. We're going to be looking at closing uh, Clark Avenue uh, as a part of this temporary traffic control plan and adding uh, speed humps on Pelton. So we'll be directing traffic onto Columbia and Pelton uh, as they do the work in front of uh, the 900 block of Westcliff. And then one other big news uh, item <coughs> to announce is the Bethany Curve Culvert. Uh, we've been awarded or approved, I should say, uh, emergency funding from FHWA. Uh, it's $10.5 million with the local match, and we expect to start that project in spring of next year. Thank you. And with that, I'll pass it on to uh, Lee Butler, our planning director. Good evening, Mr. Butler. Thank you, Mayor, and good evening, council members. Um, I have one slide as well. So our local coastal program was last updated and approved by the city council in 1992. So there have been a lot of things that have changed since then. Um, we are looking to update our local coastal program right now um, to reflect the updated land use maps that we have, as well as to acknowledge the changes in sea level rise and climate change that we all know are happening before us. Um, we've been coordinating with the community and the Coastal Commission for the last several years, and um, we have half of our draft policy sections into the Coastal Commission right now, or by the end of this week, we'll have half of them um, to the Coastal Commission for an informal review. The other half of those policy sections we're anticipating having to them um, in October or maybe in November. Um, the policy chapters along with the land use plan are the most significant portions of the local coastal program update, but there are other portions that go along with that. We're working on the introduction section and community setting and figures and maps and so forth. When will the council see those? The, the council will first see the beaches, bluffs, and hazards and adaptation chapter. Um, that chapter we are front-loading. We um, sent that to the Coastal Commission back in um, late July, I believe it was, and we're hoping to um, get comments from them, um, have that out for public comment, and then uh, get in front of the Planning Commission and City Council either late this year or early next year. The remainder of the LCP update will be um, presenting to the Council later in 2024, likely in the summertime. And that will partially depend on uh, that coordination with the Coastal Commission as well as with the community, but those are the target dates at this point. That's my update, and I'll pass it back over to Michael. Great, thank you. Um, and so when, when you also think about the, the other work efforts in process, and you're thinking about the timing of the local coastal plan, of the local hazard mitigation plan, 
Staff is coordinating behind the scenes with us on the consultant team to make sure that these documents talk to each other. And this is something that is not always easy for local governments to do. As you all know, uh, lots of plans get developed on different timelines, and uh, we've been, we were joking recently that this is somewhat of an alignment of stars uh, because there are so many documents being updated concurrently. We do have an opportunity, particularly out on Westcliff, to create an aligning vision that is embedded or at least influences a number of these other work streams. So I uh, just note that that's happening behind the scenes. So you'll continue to see that consistency uh, as documents come before you over the next six months plus. So uh, some of you weren't able to attend the August 15th council session, um, but I, I hopefully those that were able to participate uh, found it entertaining and exciting, but also enlightening about uh, this 50-year time horizon is a very long time from now. If we think about 1973 and what people were thinking about in 2023, it was probably a little bit different than how we actually landed, uh, right? Computers, cell phones, uh, how we get around, um, et cetera. And so we, we had an exercise where we, uh, we actually tried to get in that headspace of what is 50 years in the future. And so we had uh, public members uh, contribute newsletter, uh, newspaper article headlines, uh, ideas, and the council members that were present did as well. And so we had a, a I used my best uh, news uh, reading voice uh, to, to highlight some of these, um, but just some great examples of, um, of where uh, the alignment occurs across how people think about the future is, you know, Santa Cruz is a leader on community resilience. Santa Cruz has dealt with issues proactively. Uh, Santa Cruz has protected a huge community asset and a resource. And so there's, those are some of the aligning things that came forward. And I'm sure all of you probably heard different things that, that were here that really connected you to that reality of what's in 50 years in the future. And so this vision that we're developing is really intended to create an aligning set of understandings about what West, uh, what Westcliff looks like in 50 years and, and a, a little bit of how do we get there. And what are those implementation steps? What are some of the constraints? Obviously, there's the pragmatic state of, you know, we don't know what the regulatory environment is in the future. We don't know what the environmental conditions are exactly are in the future, although we have really good ideas based on the forecasting and the work of staff and uh, thinking about the future from a sea level rise dynamic. Um, and then we also, uh, you know, understand that there's going to be probably innovations in society that take us to a little bit different space in how we use space, how we occupy place and space, how people interact with each other. Um, so just a few notes that these are some of the large and big issues that we're gonna be grappling with in this vision. Next, uh, next page. Uh, so, um, so when we think about the, the vision and the roadmap, there are two separate things because the vision is really a high level guiding, guiding document that is intended to create alignment across multiple different work streams within the city. And the roadmap is about taking that high level vision and looking at the projects and the policies that apply on Westcliff and, and uh, ensuring that they actually feed towards that longer term vision. As we all know, there's oftentimes policies on the book or a CIP project that's been sitting on the books for 20 years that may not respond to the, like, the current reality of what you all wanna see, what the community wants to, be, to see done. So our attempt right now is really to help bring those forward in a, in a more productive way that aligns with a longer term vision. Next. And the purpose is, um, well, I mean, you know, I think I already went over this, but like, what do we look like in 50 years for, as, uh, as Westcliff? Um, to identify some of the considerations that, that go into that vision, but also not really limiting ourselves knowing that that 50 years from now could be very different than its current state. And that uh, the more pragmatic side of it is the roadmap side. Um, the vision is more about a more aspirational side. So you'll see that those elements come forward as these, these come forward to you. And uh, as in addition to the, to the workshops and the city council meetings, uh, we also have another layer of public engagement, which is the Westcliff Focus Group. And so the purpose of the focus group is, is really to provide recommendations to the city manager and how he will bring that forward into the shared space with feedback we're getting from the public and the workshops, in addition to the consultant and staff uh, leadership that are applied uh, to this work. And we'll be building these recommendations based on uh, this consortium, this collection of recommendations and feedback and, and focus that's coming into this work. So next steps, there's a lot of points on this map because there's a lot of touch points with the public. 
with focus groups with the city council. Uh, so you'll be seeing a fair amount of us over the next few months. I'm excited about that. Uh, and uh, we'll also have a, a number of different touch points with, with the public in public workshops uh, and a focused engagement opportunity around Westcliff as a recreation resource. Um, we'll have, uh, and this will be publicly available as well. So, the <laughs> I don't have to take a picture for my notes. <laughs> you can take a picture for your notes. It's great. Uh, and so, the the objective is to uh, to have a final document in January, and really to celebrate this vision that applies out on Westcliff. So, there's a lot of work to be done now and then, between now and then, and we are working with the staff interagency working group really closely to make sure that we're we're moving forward quickly, efficiently. Um, but also uh, uh, meaningfully, you know, we want the other side of this to, to look um, uh, to create some some real positive impact for Westcliff and for the city of Santa Cruz. Uh, so I think that's next next step, next page. Yeah. So that is it. Erica Smart is is uh, <laughs> wonderfully offered her email address as the contact, uh, but obviously uh, happy to answer any questions um, and uh, have any further discussion you'd like. Thank you. We'll start with questions around the council. Ms. Brenner? Who is the Westcliff focus group? You know, I knew you'd ask that question, and I'm sure Jen will quickly uh, pull that up for us. Uh, so we've, uh, we've chosen a, a, a group of representative community members um, that both uh, operate on Westcliff and across the city, um, and uh, topical experts uh, that really represent uh, all the different angles that we've been hearing from uh, in the public engagement on Westcliff, um, and those folks that have been engaged historically, but also uh, folks that are uh, folks that um, we think can add some significant value to the discussions. So, if if you don't mind, I can go through the list. Is that okay? So we have, and obviously this is this will be publicly available. Uh, Juliana Denyk uh, as a community member. Um, Emily Canardi is a community member. We have a, a city staff representative, Nathan, uh, and Tony, uh, city staff as well. Um, Hillary Bryant as a nonprofit member. Uh, Donna Myers is a nonprofit member. Uh, Ross Clark is a climate scientist and subject matter expert. And um, scrolling a little further down, uh, Abi Mustafa from the environmental justice uh, side. Uh, of the equation, Darren Pound for, as a business representative, uh, Jonah Chizinski for as a youth member, and Ron Goodman from the cycling community. Um, collected together with that are uh, two staff members, uh, Laura uh, Schmidt and Tiffany Wise West, and the consultant team as well that'll be supporting, and uh, as well as the leadership of, of Matt Huffaker, who uh, these recommendations will be going forward towards. Thank you. If I might, there will be other questions. Uh, the uh, the list that you just read, um, am I to assume that Ms. Myers is on that list because she, she doesn't live in the community anymore. She lives in Carmel Valley. So I want to make sure, is she here because of her work expertise? What, what is the thing there? I think the world of her. I'm just, I'm a little, I'm not quite sure that I understand why she's on there. So Donna Myers is a, has been hired on as a active engagements with Save Westcliff. So Donna's a specific representative on a, one of our active, uh, uh, active uh, coordinating uh, nonprofits in the area. I don't know, um, Matt, if you had anything else to say on. I think that's right. What I would also add is there was a lot of intention of selecting folks that had a variety and a diversity of technical expertise. Uh, Donna, while no longer resides here, as Michael was mentioning, has been providing a significant amount of um, consulting support, technical expertise to the Save West Cliff group, as well as the visioning process as a whole. Yeah, I think in that capacity, that makes sense. Thank you on that. Um, I uh, also, when you're going through that, I'm. I'm not entirely sure what you're trying to, what you think this uh, uh, focus group is supposed to reflect. Is it, is your, your desire to put something together that is reflective of the demography of the city? Is it, because I'm not sure I heard at least what appeared to me to be 
persons with uh, Latino surnames. I'm not sure I heard, I don't, you know, I don't know ethnicity of everybody and gender and other issues, but what are you trying to, what are you trying to replicate here? So what, what we're trying to do is add an additional layer of focused engagement with community members that have a particular expertise related to Westcliff and bring them forward in a more focused way to answer some specific questions about what this longer term vision looks like. So uh, topical expertise, uh, geographic expertise, community expertise, and bring those in in a more layered way. Um, it is, it's not possible with 11 people to represent the entire cross section of the community. That I readily admit that. Yeah. Um, but there is an attempt to, to capture uh, a number of the different positions that, that have been active and can certainly influence that longer term vision. So the issue I have on that is uh, this is a this is a roadway which can be characterized by some people as a neighborhood thoroughfare, <laughs> some people an international destination, <laughs> or other people can be this can be defined so many ways, but it does seem if within our relatively small city we're trying to have that focus group have some to be somewhat reflective of the larger community i would suggest that you uh, did you say there was a student on here mm -hmm. okay from from where santa from santa, santa cruz, cruz high, school? high school well if we're putting a santa cruz high school student on there i think uh, even if we're not uh, i don't mean to draw the comparison I, I think that's fine to have a Santa Cruz High School student on there. I do wonder about, I return to my previous question. It, it seems to me that maybe we're missing a couple of demographic pieces that you might want to put in there because A, it's very valuable, and B, we'll be criticized at the end of this if we don't do that at the front of this. I may just add one other thing and then maybe invite uh, Laura to come up and, and share anything else that she may have to, to share on this. but. Um, when we look at the focus group, it is one piece of this larger engagement set of engagement activities. We have our uh, state and federal interagency partners that we'll be working with. Uh, we have our public workshops that we're working with. We've had the engagement we've already done. We have concurrent engagement happening around the local hazard mitigation plan and the adaptation plan. Um, so this is one. This is one piece of that. But I just I wanted to just add that flavor because it is. That um, doesn't. Just so we're clear with each other, I, thank you for that. It, it doesn't respond to my issue, and I'm not trying to be argumentative here. It just doesn't respond to my issue. I mean, I don't understand how a high school student from Santa Cruz makes it on, but 25, 20, 25% of our demographics in here don't make it on. That's my issue with you on it, okay. and I think you ought to change it. <laughs> Thanks, Mayor. We can um, definitely talk with you offline. We did reach out to the Santa Cruz Equity Collab, and that is how we got the environmental justice recommendation from them. So we have reached out. Again, I'm, we're going to go through this for a while, I can tell. Um, and that's OK with me. It's, just, it's not a problem. Um, Equity Collab is an interest group that is different than inviting and seeking out a demographic from our community that seems to be absent in their list. And I'm sorry, council member. Well, we'll, go, we'll get to other council member. Do you have a response on that? Um, can you be more specific as yes. to the demographic you're looking for? Unless, and we'd unless be happy I heard to. It wrong, you don't have a, a Latino or Latina on that list, uh, which may both represent a, a demographic group as well as an income group. It just seems like a glaring omission. We, we can definitely reach out and address that. We we thought that the list that we had 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 a good mix of age demographics, different community, just membership, as well as special interest groups. So we were trying to balance that, but we can definitely address your um, concern and find another person. I, I, let me make sure you don't misunderstand what I'm doing here. I, I like what you've put together. I, I like it a lot. I think it's quite good. I'm trying to add value to it and, and fill a hole that appears to be pretty obvious. 
Yes. Okay. Thank you. Let we me can see look if into that. Any questions or comments, Ms. Brown? If, just following on the mayor's point, I'm uh, thinking about UCSC as well, um, UCSC students in particular. Um, I'm thinking back to the presentation we received uh, involving traffic studies and, and where the traffic was coming from, and it was like hands down the greatest number of trips were coming from the, the university, that, that part of town. So I think that, that that sure suggested to me that UCSC students and the UCSC community has a real interest as well in um, being engaged at, you know, at, at that higher level, not just doing a survey um, or showing up at, for a, a session, but it feels like that's also missing, perhaps. Um, maybe I'm missing something. We, we can add that. Okay. Let me move around the council, see if there are other questions, comments. Ms. Collintar Johnson. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Certainly. Um, just a couple of comments. Thank you for the work and the presentation um, <clears throat> and your movement on this. Um, about the focus group, I mean, I, I, I'm really appreciative of the intent behind it of to gather some minds from the community, um, help us inform. Um, I want to confirm that that is one way that will help us inform what it looks like. So that's not just what the focus group says or does that's going to shape the 50 year plan. I want to confirm that. Absolutely. Um, and then I, you know, I also understand the challenges around creating a focus group that's manageable in size but also the need for representation. I think Mayor Keeley and Councilmember Brown have brought up some um, good specific examples of who may be missing that's our, that are significant voices in our community. So um, that's a challenge, keeping it to a, a, a group that is feasible to get things done, but then also making sure that we have representation. So I would confirm that uh, Latina, Latino voice, um, a student voice, and that I do want to comment on the youth, um, the youth member who is on. That is our youth liaison that we have as the city. That was our commitment with the Children and Youth Bill of Rights, is to engage our youth liaison and to have our youth liaison engage in these types of um, community engagement projects that we have. So, um, I guess those are my comments. Just you have you have a tough task before you in terms of. Oh, I had one more actually group. Um, uh, some community members reached out, and I believe that no one who lives on Westcliff is part of that focus group either. So something to consider, um, since they will be impacted. Um, so I, it's I, a tough, I, tough task that you have is to keep it, keep it to a, a doable group, but have it be representative. And I'm happy to share more of my thoughts offline as you're forming this. Oh, and the other thing, sorry, last thing. <laughs> Um, we don't want to get stuck in the process of forming a fo focus group for us to move ahead in the work. So I'm cognizant of that as well. Vice Mayor, is right. oh, excuse Can me, I? just a second. Ms. Smith, did you have a response there? Yes, please. thank you very much. Um, thank you, Council Member Colantari Johnson. As far as input and feedback, the focus group is only one mechanism for input into the 50-year vision process. We will still be hosting multiple community members community-based meetings that are open to the entirety of the public. Um, related to the question of residency on Westcliff, I believe at least two people on the current focus group live near in that Westcliff neighborhood. So. In the neighborhood, but not on Westcliff, correct? Okay. We can find out. We afterwards. can talk offline, because okay. I don't want to talk addresses, yeah. obviously, of our focus group members right now. But yeah, yeah, yeah we can double, yeah. 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 Thank you. The vice mayor is recognized. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was hoping that Matt or Laura would speak to this before we got to here, but I just wanted to say that I, I did get reached out to, and I don't know if anybody else did aside from the two of us about this over the weekend. And I think that the concern from people in the community was the lack of transparency in the selection of the focus group. And after I spoke with the city manager yesterday, um, he explained to me, and I believe his intent to be true, that the intent was to expedite the process so that we can um, continue to meet our deadlines and get moving with the repairs and not just the repairs, but the long-term vision so we're eligible for different grants and things like that. And so I just wanted to um, appreciate the intent of staff and they were really trying to find a diverse group 
And I guarantee if you picked 11 people from town, someone would have a problem with someone. So, um, but I do see the people that are missing from the group, and I appreciate the intent to correct that. Thank you. And, and Mayor, if I may just quickly respond to that. Sure. I appreciate those comments, Councilmember Golder, and in, in addition to what Laura has shared, I just want to make crystal clear that um, this focus group is not a, will not be a decision-making body. They are one of many sounding boards, one of many touch points that we'll be moving through over the, the course of the next few months. And really appreciate the feedback around wanting to ensure that the focus group accurately captures the great diversity that we have in this community um, to allow for a real robust discussion as we work through these issues. Appreciate that feedback, and that's certainly achievable. We, we will work on that. And I, I hope that the community, based upon the experience of how we got to the three-year post-recovery roadmap and the engagement that they experienced then, I think it was very positive. Hopefully they will remember that and take that to heart, that that is not going to change in the 50-year vision process with this focus group. The focus group is an additive um, sounding board for the, our ability to develop information and um, constructs quickly to then be digested and, and given feedback by the larger community. That level of community engagement and transparency, we are committed to and we will continue the work that we did in the roadmap into the 50-year vision. Thank you, good work, excellent work. Uh, further comments, council members? Further questions? If, if I might, I, I, uh, I'm not quite sure where I want to direct this, so I'll just make it and then somebody will come up and talk about it. Uh, when we, Mr. Nguyen and I had a colloquy a couple, few weeks ago about this, and then he and I were at the Clean Ocean Business Award dinner, is that what we were at, and sat next to each other. I continued the conversation a little bit. Um, and, and so now I want to do a little bit in public and return to this item, so that's the predicate on this. Um, as we begin moving through this, you were indicating how many public policy documents need to be feathered together on this and how many agencies, state, federal, and local, will you know, poke their finger into this pie at one point or another. Um, last time we did this in public, I, I inquired as to what we believe, based on what you know today, what you believe the California Coastal Commission with, from a policy perspective, where are they starting on this after years of them lecturing local governments about managed retreat and so on, which seemed to be their, qual their policy for quite a long time? This isn't that. This is not managed retreat at this stage. Uh, either the temporary fixes, and I haven't heard anything that indicates that what we're, we're saying to the community on the 50-year vision is, it's a managed retreat vision. But the Coastal Commission has been there for decades. I'm wondering how we square that circle at the outset here. Happy to start and- uh, Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, for that question. I uh, don't purport to read the tea leaves too well. Um, you know, th I think what we're, we're finding ourselves in right now with the Coastal Commission, particularly in the context of manage retreat and uh, community relocation, the different terms we use for moving infrastructure, moving right of way to address risk, reduce risk, is a kind of a regulatory amorphous environment right now because their policies are on the book that says they, they really don't want to um, support development or ongoing maintenance of structures that have repetitive loss. We also see the insurance companies uh, also uh, taking that same stance while at the same time, uh, there's questions about the legality of their regulatory authority to be in that space and making those assessments. Um, so there's a, a current discussion taking place on uh, where they're going to land eventually. And uh, so there's not actually a real clear answer on what the future holds. So when I talk about kind of this regulatory dynamic for the 50-year vision, uh, we're also looking at the unknowns of how the courts respond to challenges of how our regulatory system uh, continues to evolve over time. Um, but we do understand that there's social drivers for, uh, uh, for making decisions in some communities that are stronger to take one direction or the other. 
And so this 50-year vision is, is intended to explore that. Uh, so there's no predefined kind of assessment on what phased retreat looks like in Santa Cruz. Um, but this vision is going to tackle that. It is going to be one of those challenging discussions that we have across the community. Thank you for that. Two other questions, if I might. Let me ask a follow-up question on this item. Uh, with regard to how we are visioning this 50-year picture, where, what we're managing towards, while we're in that, let's say over the next year or so, I imagine we're going to be in this for a while. You're not going to be back here in six months and we've got something we're doing, right? I manage this takes us a while. But I imagine at the outset, we and you must be making certain assumptions about what our partners, if you will, in the state and federal government, because otherwise what is the purpose of this exercise if we're doing it without reference to what we think they're thinking about this as we move along. So I want you to think about that. And let me go to the second question. Maybe you can wrap them together. You mentioned insurance companies. Our insurance company is the Federal Emergency Management Agency and the Federal Highway Administration. That's who we call our insurance company. And I would guess like the other insurers around the coast of the United States are running as fast as they can away and the reinsurers are doing the same thing from areas, whether it's hurricanes or floods or whatever it may be, they're doing everything they can to reduce their risk when the risk is going up. So with regard to our insurer, Federal Emergency Management Agency and the Federal Highway Administration, what assumptions are we making about them going forward as we plan is presumably we have to do that somewhat hand in glove with our insurer. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that it is a uh, right now the uh, federal interagency is showing uh, indication, indications that they're not willing to invest in infrastructure recovery projects that expose that infrastructure to repetitive loss scenarios, meaning multiple disasters when, within certain time frames, they really don't want to see funding, federal funding flow uh, to those projects. And so when we think about um, six feet of sea level rise by end of century, what does that do to coastal infrastructure um, or a change in the direction of extreme storms? What does that do to coastal infrastructure? How does that affect the coast differently? How does apply certain mitigate, applying certain mitigations like nature-based solutions more aggressively uh, on the coast, how that might mitigate some of that risk as sea levels rise, as uh, storms change directions? So these are all questions that um, we don't fully have the answers to for 50 years from now, right? That's a very long time. We do have some strong understandings based on the modeling done through the adaptation planning work led by staff over the past you know, five plus years that does allow us to kind of understand some of those long-term scenarios better. But when we place that into the context of what are the federal uh, agencies that fund recovery projects and long-term resilience projects, what are they gonna do? Um, we understand that, uh, for example, FEMA, as of uh, mid, mid this month, will run out of money for their recovery funds. Uh, so uh, typically they last for the entire year. Um, compounded with the federal budget, potentially uh, the federal shutdown potentially occurring in October, there's a real risk of uh, delays or uh, disconnects on those post-disaster recovery dollars. So we don't anticipate seeing any less of that as costs continue to rise on recovery. Um, more and more of those uh, federal dollars are gonna need to flow to local recovery efforts. So the question that we have is, well, what's that upper limit? You know, is there an upper limit to how much the federal interagency is going to spend to help local governments recover from these disasters? And when do we hit that limit? Is it next year? Is it 10 years? Is it 40 years? And so those are some of the questions that we don't really have answers to. And we've certainly been talking about this for 20 years or more. Um, so uh, I think, you know, the, uh, the scope 
of the costs have increased so much more in the past couple of years than over the prior decades. Uh, I think it's really created a focus on that discussion right now. So we're, the whole uh, United States is talking about the same thing that we're talking about tonight. You know, we see this when we're in, and I think our, our other uh, compound complex planning exercises. For example, we're looking at a major set of activities, what we call the downtown expansion plan. But as we're doing that, we make certain assumptions about the public sector, the private sector, this, that, who's doing what, based on what their mission is and so on. And, and that brings me back then to, uh, to my question, which is we can't have no assumptions about our state and federal partners. And we surely can't, I mean, it wouldn't think we would assume whatever they've done in the past, they'll do for going forward. You said as much just about two minutes ago. So in that, are we, are, are you or we going to build certain assumption scenarios? Here's one which assumes FEMA isn't gonna replace every 10 years when you have a presidentially declared disaster and the storm, the nature of what we just had. Those are gonna happen. We're gonna get more of those. And so this isn't a one-off. This is more what life is going to be like. Are we going to build assumptions? Because at some point, based on what assumptions we make, that clearly engages in the cost shifting as to how to fix the problem. I mean, if this is all gonna be on our dime, that, that, that's a orders of magnitude different conversation than if we think, well, it may change somewhat, but our state and federal partners are going to be partners. Yeah, and I would say uh, lean more towards the latter. We no. know that, that um, we know that, that uh, the state and federal partners are going to be present. We know they're gonna be active. We know they're gonna be partners. Uh, because they always have been. The question is, how many dollars are attached to that partnership? For example, our Silver Jackets work that we'll be doing with the federal inter and state interagency, um, they've received funding to support their own staff time to help support the city's work, but that funding isn't coming to the city. Uh, that is to support that state and federal interagency. So um, we could see a different way of the state and federal government coming in to help local communities that is more technical assistance, uh, knowledge building, capacity building, that is less about funding direct infrastructure and more about funding um, the capacity for communities to respond themselves. And when we think about that, the cost of recovery is much more of an equation for local communities that are you know, facing repetitive loss issues. Because if, if you lose a certain uh, piece of infrastructure every year for five years, does it really make sense for a city or a county or whomever to actually invest in, in rebuilding that? Or do you wanna do it in a different way that is more resilient and can be recovered more cost effectively? So certainly these are some of the assumptions that we're putting into this, um, but we don't have the magic eight ball, right? We, we're not gonna be able to know exactly what that looks like. Um, and some of the scenarios that we can develop can talk broadly about that. But I think the beauty of the vision is, is we can have that be at a high enough level that links all of these policies and program documents that are being developed in the city so that we aren't tied to any one necessary scenario because it's the community wanting to see what West Cliff looks like in the future. And there's multiple pathways to get there. And so the policy and project prioritization part of the roadmap is where we're really looking at that kind of uh, those assumptions around uh, long-term uh, funding options uh, for policies and projects. That vision helps to guide that prioritization, but that's where the pragmatic piece of, of how uh, work actually gets done uh, falls into the, the priorities for uh, policies and projects. Well, I'm sorry that I'm taking up so much time. I try to keep my comments limited during our sessions each time, um, but it won't slow me down. Um, what I, based on what you just said, let me let me inquire a little further. Uh, the if what we do is say to the community in a wide variety of ways, here's a focus group here, and here's public meetings here, and here's 
those are all very good. I'm, I'm not diminishing the value. I think they're incredibly valuable. But if there's no sideboards around it on who's going to pay for it, how this is going to be brought into reality, then you can dream any damn thing you want to dream. <laughs> you know, we can have monorails, we can, right? I mean, it, it, it's got to be a real plan that is constrained by something. And so I think the longer we go with the public thinking they can envision any doggone thing they want to without understanding where the cost implications are going to fall. I think we ought to make that real clear at the outset to help people regulate their own appetites on this. Yeah, and absolutely, you know, we've, uh, I think, just to respond to that, there is more specificity in the roadmap work, but there is a broader set of assumptions around regulatory, environmental, social conditions that we have to include in the vision. Otherwise, per your point, it's, you know, is anything anywhere, everywhere, all at once. Um, and, uh, and that reality is, you know, I bring a level of pragmatism to visions that, um, uh, that we've helped develop in the past that uh, kind of innately reflect that there's limitations on what we can do in the real world, um, but also acknowledging that a vision is intended to be built to uh, push the envelope sometimes and really create Absolutely. a stretch objective for a community to something that, that is achievable but is really going to be require some work to achieve and um and i think there's a there's a balance to be had between pragmatism and a, a bold vision that is unachievable uh and uh, having a balance between those two can create some really wonderful things for communities thank you other other members questions or comments ms brown thank you um well i'll, I'll just i just want to put a fine point on the Coastal Commission's role here. I think the the point about f funding these kinds of projects, aside from the the regulatory, the ability to get approvals, um, is an important one. Um, so thank you for raising that, uh, Mayor. Um, but I I also want to just put a fine point on the the Coastal Commission's role here because, um, as the mayor suggested, the Coastal Commission has had uh, you know an, a managed retreat uh, lens. And that has not changed. I do spend quite a bit of time now with the Coastal Commission agenda items and meetings, and so I, um, I, I hear from the staff, and I hear com what commissioners have to say. And um, there was a at our, the last meeting uh, an armoring item for um, the east side, which folks might want to look at if you have a, want to have a sense of where <laughs> the Coastal Commission staff is at. Um, they, you know, and they found a way to approve it because in this case there was, um, you know, some real potential improvement in public access at that, at, um, at sewers, uh, at the, the surf break there at Rockview. Um, and so, and, and that argument is obviously going to be in play with respect to Westcliff, but um, their their view has not changed, and that vote they barely, I, I haven't been able to confirm the vote, but I'm it, I think it squeaked by. So um, and that was a, a pretty minor, I, minor one. So I just think that um, and I I've talked with the city manager about this, and I really appreciate hearing you know that the the st I know that our staff is engaged with coastal staff kind of at, at every step of the way, and um, and so I want to. Just make sure that the council also is aware of, um, you know, how those conversations are going, um, where we might need to have a role in the expectations management um, as we move through this. So, and and thank you. I really appreciate the the work. It's it's definitely not easy <laughs> to bring people together and and try to do something like this. That's a major project in the context of so much uncertainty, and uh, you know being under-resourced, so thank you. Vice Mayor is recognized. I just want to confirm, the money, most of the money we got was, or a lot of the money was because it's designated FH, from the FHWA, or right? Right now. Yeah, um, <clears throat> the, the funding that we received for the info walls and Bethany curb repairs is from FHWA's Emergency Opening Program. 
And <clears throat> it's eligible for that program because Westcliff Drive is deemed a federal aid route. And so that's why it's still eligible for that funding. And I wanted to kind of come up earlier to <clears throat> talk about funding too. In addition to the emergency response efforts that we've been awarded this year and in some previous years, the roadmap work envisioning process is to allow us to use this plan to help get additional funding dollars that are more resilient. You know, we have an infrastructure bill that was passed that we're still working its way through the state and through the different programs, including FHWA. So it's not just emergency response work that we're going after. We're really looking at these bigger dollars, uh, resiliency dollars, climate adaptation type of dollars that are out there. And there is a lot that's um, available, but we really need to have a vision to help us apply for those and really move those kind of things forward. So it's, I don't believe a, a, a local thing where it's just a state, we're also going to be trying to uh, utilize our local dollars and leverage them for these other grant sources. Thank you. And I imagine through the visioning process, you'll be looking at ways to explore possible local funding like our parking district or a toll road or something along those lines where where um, we could have a continued revenue stream as part of the process, right? That's correct. Okay, thank you. If I could add to that just real quickly, Vice Mayor, there's also a number of other exciting potential opportunities we could explore from a local sustainable funding standpoint. That includes things like climate resiliency districts, uh, infrastructure financing districts that both can raise local revenues for major infrastructure projects like we're discussing as part of the vision. and. We'll be exploring those as part of the roadmap as well. Council Member Watkins, and then Council Member Bennett. Council Member Watkins. Yeah, I'll, I'll be brief as well. Um, but I just, I, you know, I'll thank you for the work and, and the ambitious timeline. I always take the opportunity when we talk about funding to just to remind folks that, you know, we've talked about our lobbying efforts, and I think we're going to need to continue doing that as a local community. We're not alone in our need and certainly won't be moving forward. And so however we're advocating for more dollars from the state and feds is, is really critical in terms of our lobbying um, initiatives that we have with our partners. But also just to remind folks that, you know, we've been part of this lawsuit against um, oil companies who have knowingly um, admitted to the impacts they've caused as a result of um, hiding the uh, evidence around the carbon emissions associated with oil and for many, many years. And so part of that lawsuit requires that we stay on top of that and know what's going on, but also acknowledging that this shouldn't only fall on the backs of our local taxpayers. So however, we're factoring that into our visioning in terms of a pragmatic approach, but just also acknowledging the truth around where and how we've landed in this space today and certainly where we need to go uh, including local resources as well. So anyways, I appreciate the effort, I appreciate the presentation, the balance of all the different considerations, and I look forward to the touch points along the way. Council Member Bruner. Uh, thank you for those updates on the projects and the infill walls and um, the three-year post-recovery. Um, very interesting. Uh, thoughts have come from all of those updates. But thank you also for the website because um, I, I continue to get interested people asking about status and updates and timing and timelines and what is the future and when. And so thank you for keeping that website on the city of Santa Cruz.com website about Westcliff. Um, updated so that we can direct people there. I think it's really important to continue with that. And um, any opportunity to um, even have something like, are you, like, do you need Spanish? Do you need your information in Spanish? Click here and then we can get their information and work with them. Um, I don't know if that's come up, but I'm always kind of cognizant of just at least having that option for people to select that as something they might need. Um, and then um, I, there was recently a group of folks who reached out, and um, I'm glad to see all those community groups um, that are coming on the next steps uh, graph that was shown on the slide. 
um, because there are many, many people interested in the 50-year vision plan. And, you know, I think really what our community um, is hoping to have simple things like reduced speed on Westcliff Drive and safe spaces for pedestrians to walk and safe spaces for bicycles to ride bicycles without sharing and bumping into pedestrians and and cars, right? Like those are simple things that people are are speaking to and and so as part of all of this it um, the traffic study is that part of that process that is is still in in the works? Yeah, thank you for the question, uh, Councilmember Brunner. The traffic study is not included specifically in the 50-year vision work, but some level of traffic analysis or discussion will be, have to be included as a part of that 50-year vision, but not specifically like a traffic impact study um, is ne not necessarily scoped at this moment. Can you just, is I don't know if it's brief, but can you speak to that difference and why we are on that path versus a traffic impact study? Uh, for a traffic impact study, we would be looking at the volumes and circulation um, at a more detailed and granular level. I think the 50-year vision roadmap work is much more of a, again, a, it's more of a plan, not a project level of implementation. And so uh, it wouldn't be appropriate to necessarily have a, a full traffic impact study unless we have a fully defined project. So, okay, that makes sense. So having uh, traffic analysis and vision, and then at some point after we have a vision, then it might go to traffic impact study to see if that vision can be. Subsequently, we'd, we'd likely have projects that would fall, come from the visioning process, and then within those projects, we would have specific traffic impact studies associated with those projects. Um, okay, I think, you know, it's given us a lot of thought, with, and I appreciate all the updates so that we can build really what we want and budget for the future. I think the funding um, part of it is um, helpful to hear as well in terms of the regulatory environment, so thanks. Um, I also just wanted to let you know and the public know that there's a translate button on our website, and if you click that, you can, cl you can select a language. And then the website uses Google translation services, and you're able to read the content on any web page in the language that you selected. Wonderful. It's translated by Google, though. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Other questions or comments at this time? This would be the opportunity for anyone who's wish uh, with us who wishes to make comment on this item. This would be your opportunity to do so. Ms. Bush, should we have, come on, let's go. Do we have anyone online? We do. Okay. We're going to toggle back and forth. Good afternoon again, or good evening Hi. again. Hello. Can you hear me? Yo, we certainly My name is Robert, and as I told you before, I'm a native Santa Cruzan. I've lived on the west side, actually the lower west side of Santa Cruz, all my life. In the last 25 years, I've had the fortunate opportunity to live on West Cliff Drive. Um, and this focus group... Uh, I knew nothing about it until attending this meeting. And I think somebody on West Cliff Drive and on the west side should be involved in this group or at least be reached out to, whether they're involved on a, a regular basis. Um, I have not received any notifications in the mail or anything other than notifications for Iron Man or... <laughs> um, the races, et cetera, or Westcliff's going to be closed. So um, it would be nice to receive something in the mail so that I could take part in the community. They say the community, but I don't know, quote, unquote, who is the community. I thought I was part of the community. Okay. Um, so I would um, like to be more involved in this process. The other thing, you talk about the vision. And that's the area I'd like to be most involved in. You know, repairing the road, that needs to be done. And however that has to be done, it needs to be done. But going forward, um, 
I, I would think it'd be important to bring people on board that have had the history of living here and being part of the community in 1973 so that they could, they could tell you firsthand what they thought the vision would be in 2023. I think that would play a role in looking where we're gonna be 50 years from now. And Westcliff Drive not only serves the local community of Santa Cruz, it serves the whole state. And like you said, it's an international destination as Santa Cruz is, the boardwalk, the downtown, and Westcliff Drive. You know, a while back, I'm kind of rambling a little bit, but a while back, I sat um, on my front porch with my dog, and I counted how many cars went by three o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday. And 997 vehicles passed in front of my house in one hour. That didn't count the bicycles, the skateboarders, the pedestrians walking, the people walking with their strollers, with their babies. My point is Westcliff Drive serves our whole life cycle of our community members and the members that visit our community. And we need to, we need to include that in the vision, okay? And then the other thing is, the, one, more, one more point and then I'll leave. No, um, the Coastal Commission, why not make them part of our process? Why not make them part of the uh, focus group? Why not invite one of their members and have them ownership so that they can sell their own people on our vision? Make them part of it. We'll win. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take the next person online, then Ms. Greensight, we'll be right back with you. Ms. Bush, we have someone online. Good evening, yes. person online. Yes, this is Garrett. Yes, this is Garrett. Hey, Santa Cruz Equity Cohab, <laughs> so-called environmental rehab, or Abby Mustafa, are absolutely not experts in Westcliff anything as a focus group. Isn't she mostly an artist who lived in mostly ultra-radical leftist Oakland? Hey, who's walking out there? Oh, yeah, of course, it's always, uh, you know, the same person. Anyway, um, this is leftist baloney, to put it politely. Leftist excrement would be more precise. I'm not interested in Malcolm X motivated violence is justified or admire Malcolm X's put a hand on the Muslim Brotherhood, I'll put you in the graveyard types involved in totally unrelated Westcliff policy. Are you freaking kidding me? How do you sleep at night? Have you considered the benefits of reason and logic in your actions? I applaud the mayor, at least on this one little point, which seems to be questioning the makeup of this first focus group as not inclusive of, well, normal people. But this managed retreat, as I have said many times, is the last ditch, no options available, nothing can be done that will have any benefit type action, and we're not there yet. Any action before that to abandon the private property on the coast is a violation of the city's obligation to protect the people and their property. I lose confidence in the city government every meeting, pushing these fear-based globalist power grab agendas and the con job focus groups and their surveys. Okay, it's way past half the hour and I gotta go to dinner, bye. Thank you. Ms. Greenslight, good evening. Mayor, council members, um, the mayor asked a good question. Uh, what is the purpose of this exercise, this 50-year vision exercise? And for many of us, it feels or it seems to be a very expensive, very time-consuming, uh, consultant-heavy, uh, cherry-pick focus group that has an agenda. And uh, if that uh, feels like a, a loss of trust, well, that's how it appears. Because um, it's no secret that there's a big uh, voice to have Westcliff one way, irrespective of the impact on the lower, particularly the lower west side. And it seems that there is a vision, but there's not a substance there. Um, I personally... <laughs> I agree, diversity on any group is important. 
I think it would be um, uh, it would be wise to ask all of your people who are picked. I don't know how you pick them. I think there would be better ways to get representation. Where do they stand on turning Westcliff Drive into a one-way road? And if you get 90% think that's a great idea, then that's not at all representative of the community. As you go forward, I haven't heard any inclusion of two things which I think should be in this picture and have never been mentioned. The late Al Mitchell, for whom Mitchell's Cove was named and was a good friend, he gave to the city a plan for keeping Westcliff two-way to traffic widening the areas so you could better accommodate the other uses. And um, uh, that was never mentioned. The other fact that is never mentioned, I brought this up many times when I was on that uh, technical advisory committee, the city has far, a five-foot easement along the entire length of Westcliff. But that doesn't factor in. The focus seems to be on turning Westcliff Drive into one way. So I really think that there needs to be a little bit of a pause here. I understand expedite the process, as the city manager said, in terms of repairs, and I really applaud the, the Public Works Department for getting the funding and moving ahead, but this vision doesn't need to be expedited. I'd say slow it down and do it properly and be more transparent. And lastly, uh, I'd remind you, and I said it the last time, but I guess one needs to repeat it. Your city engineers said that the section of the Westcliff Drive that failed was areas that had not been maintained since the 90s. That the sections that were new, with riprap we're talking about, stood up well. Well, we're putting walls and uh, riprap back in. So this, this sort of narrative that gets put out, and I'm, I'm just got your words uh, from the consultant, that every year if we have to keep doing this, is the funding going to be there? That, that's, that's sort of a, 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 an approach that has an answer that doesn't deal with reality. It may not be that it's every year or even every 10 years if we do it right. The Coastal Commission has supported doing riprap because it was pointed out by your uh, public works director that if we could lose the road. So that's going to be done. The rest, to me, is like an agenda that everybody gets to weigh in and many of us are suspicious, especially with this sort of cherry-picked focus group. Um, and I like the mayor's statement, which uh, I'll remember, um, in the face of this reality, people may have to regulate their appetites. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else online? No one with their hand right. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Mayor Keeley, council members. Um, what I wanted to do tonight is actually thank the city um, for uh, the decision that was made. You may recall that I was here two weeks ago and I stood up and was very concerned along with my neighbors in the Pelton Clark uh, Columbia Triangle that um, there was no traffic calming. And as a result of that meeting, uh, the city went back and reevaluated that and came back with the speed humps and the Clark Avenue closing. And so I just want to say thank you for that, for actually listening to us and taking action. Second thing, I want to uh, voice my concern as well. Some, why don't you do some turnaround thanks, Public Works Director. There you go. Okay, good. Um, and Matt and Claire and the others. Um, but second, I want to voice my concern about the lack of transparency uh, on the focus, the focus group. It, it does seem suspicious. Um, I've worked with focus groups before um, when I wasn't retired and, and uh, you know, there's a tendency for the focus groups to be um, a cherry-picked group of people that will result, that will end up with the result that is wanted by the people who picked 
the focus group. And so there's a lot of concern in the community about the lack of transparency there. And the third thing, um, the vision's great, but one of the comments that, that Nathan made is, you know, we're not going to actually see rubber hit the road until projects are created. So I know I can speak for a lot of my neighbors in the neighborhood as we want to start seeing projects around widening the bike lanes, about addressing e-bike speeding, about getting native plants put in instead of the ice plant. There's lots of tactical things that we don't want to wait five years for us to start talking about that. Let's start some of these projects now as soon as, uh, as, soon as West Cliffs reopened and we can kind of get things back to normal. Let's start some of these projects now. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Stoner, good evening. <laughs> Excuse me, Kim Stoner, Honorable Mail, uh, Council Members, Staff. Um, I'm here more to talk, you heard me talk uh, two weeks ago, I'm here more to talk about the 50-year long-range plan. And this is something to po ponder and think about because we're not talking about farmland or state park land that, or vacant land where you've got erosion. There's no big deal. We're talking about improvements across the street, single-family residences, things like that. And if the city fails to maintain West Cliff and allows retreat, the following situation may arise. If a number of West Cliff property owners with homes were to lose street access and their public utilities of water and sewer, which are all underground, the owners could file a lawsuit. Why could they? Because of a diminution of value, legal terminology, a diminished value of the property. Remedy, remedy would be eminent domain, which is the right of the government or jurisdiction to take the private property and convert it to public use. Um, condemnation is a process by which this is exercised. What I have mentioned is rooted in the Constitution under the Fifth Amendment. However, the Fifth Amendment requires payment to those landowners of just compensation, something I'm sure the city attorney understands. Market value is based on land value, improvements, location, view amenity, and most importantly, access. As an example, I took a small section of Westcliff, just the two blocks between Columbia and Woodrow and Woodrow and David Way. There's 17 homes between Columbia and Woodrow, 17 homes total. Five have ADUs or a second unit. Between uh, Woodrow and, D and David Way, there's nine homes, two with ADUs or second units, and two vacant lots. My background, I spent 25 and a half years in the real estate appraisal business. And I also spent 40 years in the title business, full-time, part-time, and as a consultant. If you do the math on 26 total homes, seven with ADUs and two vacant lots, let us say the average home on Westcliff is $3.5 on the low end right now with an ADU, five million, and a lot, one million. So taking a round number of four million for the 26 homes, you're looking at $104 million in today's market, not the future for those particular homes if some of that had to be taken by eminent domain. In the future, this is way in the future and not now. I also want to mention that the high property taxes these homes generate per year, of which the city does receive some benefit if some were lost to condemnation. Um, my interpretation, not to repeat whatever, of what other people have said, preserve West Cliff, maintain it, just don't neglect it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stoner. Former Council Member Robinson, welcome back to the chambers. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Um, I try my best to stay apprised and pay attention to what's happening on the plans for West Cliff. So I know how much work is being done on all, all fronts, all fronts. Um, so I have a couple questions for you just because this one did catch me by surprise when I looked at the agenda, because I knew two weeks ago you desperately needed to get some things accomplished before you had this visioning one today. So I knew, okay, pay attention to two weeks from now. And we all have busy lives, had a lot going on, but I, when I looked at it, I, I will, I'm gonna out myself right now. I am one of the people that really got surprised by, it was only seven page agenda item. Um, the, 
focus group did surprise me. Um, first of all, I want to also thank the mayor who referred to uh, Westcliff as a neighborhood thoroughfare because I often don't hear that area, which for the whole Lower West Side is a main artillery street, ar artery street. It's been that way for over 100 years. So at the same time, it's a huge community asset. There is no doubt about what it brings to everybody. And so this process just did have this concern like, okay, let me see, who do I know? I know quite a few of the people on here. And I understand this is what's hard for our city manager too, because he is so interested in making this be, and you said that at the very beginning, it's gonna be a really robust process. It's gonna you know, be um, transparent and everything else, but now you have this thing that you have to expedite, and then that's how I'm hearing this focus group came about. Um, so I just do wanna caution you in doing that. Several of us have been on many, many, many um, either committees, you had to apply for things, you had to try to find a way to, if you were a part of the community that would be appropriate on those committees, you usually had to apply. No, that's not happening here. Um, last night I went to the West Cliff meeting, and so I asked Nathan, and I felt like I was really bristly, because I was like, well, wait a minute here. And so I appreciated his answers. I don't get the impression that this is necessarily open to the public meetings. Um, some of them might be. Uh, so I want to just have the council ask a little bit about that. And then in the presentation tonight, t find out a little bit more so we can hear more about the Silver Jacket Group, because that's just an interesting name, but I don't understand it very well. And that also that that's part of the nature-based solutions. As a lifetime gardener, <laughs> um, I understand nature-based solutions in my world. I want to understand nature-based solutions, because that sounds like retreat to me in a lot of ways, which I thought in the documents that came about with the Climate Action Plan piece for West, Resilient Westcliff, I thought I understood that is the plan because my street I live on is the third alternative to a closure of Westcliff, which doesn't make a lot of sense. It's not a street that makes sense, but there it sits. So I'm hoping some of those questions still get asked. It's been a long night for you, but on behalf of some of us community members, I'd like those questions asked. And I know you've got a lot on your plate to do with this. Um, I want as much as we can. Those focus groups that were listed between now and October, I don't know if that's only this focus group. I'm not aware of other community meetings because usually those are not as much of two-way streets. It's us just maybe putting post-it notes up or we're listening to different groups. I will say, and I told this to Nathan too, usually when you have focus groups like this, um, you, someone was saying city staff, but it's really administrative directors of departments, typically they wouldn't be one of the focus group members. They would absolutely be there, be interacting, getting information, giving information, but they're not usually part of the group. So I feel like of 11 people, two are the administrative department heads, both um, Nathan and Tony, which I want them to be there, but I'm not so sure they should be part of the focus group. But that's just my opinion. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? Not right now. Good evening. Welcome. Here. My name's Elise Casby, environmentalist activist. Um, I just want to weigh on, in on Westcliff. Uh, a few years back, lost track of time, maybe it was 10, maybe it was 6, I went up to UCSC and watched a panel of scientists talk about cities that are on the coasts around the country, on the coast around the country dealing with this kind of problem of Westcliff erosion and trying to shore up those kinds of roads. It doesn't work. You can't shore it up. It's going, it's going to keep happening. It's millions and millions of dollars. It's not going to work. What I really think the United States needs to come to terms with is that the car, that is the, the vehicle of convenience for us to go drive from our homes to the 7-Eleven, to go 60 miles or 80 miles or 120 miles to work, it's really a failure. It's killing the planet. And what we need to do is come to terms with this. We need to have bold and creative problem solving around the country for transportation work and housing and democracy. And so what I'm going to just suggest, and I know it's a little um, random at this point, but I really think that from Lighthouse Field, the lighthouse out to uh, Natural Bridges should be closed down to traffic. Um, it should just be closed. It should be a walking, bicycling, possibly a nature uh, study place. Um, it could be a huge tourist 
uh, attraction if it were done with bold design and initiative. It's one of the most beautiful areas in the world, and the beaches are fabulous. We're not going to lose people who want to come there. They will have to maybe get out of their vehicles, hoist their stomachs up, put a girdle on, and maybe walk. That would be helpful. <laughs> Discovering the ability to walk would also be great for those citizens. <laughs> I need to walk more. So I just really wanted to encourage us to really treasure, treasure the incredible jewel, the gem, the, not just scenically, but naturally. It's so unique. I've traveled this country. My father took us camping. He used to love to go to Ocean City, New Jersey, where I grew up, and say, you see all these houses on the beaches? They're all going to be going down. The hurricanes are going to be taking them down. They're, gonna be de they're not going to be here. Our house, which is like a mile back, that's still going to be here. OK, this is real reality. This is reality. What can we do to keep and preserve our most beautiful, gorgeous beach area and still deal with cars. We can problem solve this. We can, you know, factor it out and problem solve this. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. And I hope that we will be bold and creative and actually really treasure what we have before we lose it. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Anyone else online? We're, we're good there. Anyone else with us in chambers? Matter of respect before the council. I'm, let me make uh, one point with you folks, if I could, for just a second. I do not associate myself with those comments which assume that either you or this city have some predetermined outcome and that you have cherry-picked the focus group. I do not believe that. Other, other council members, matter of fact, before the council, there is no action tonight. So if folks want to make any comments, then we'll all entertain a no, no. There is no motion there. We, we have no action items tonight at all on this item. But if council members wish to make comments, I'll entertain those, and then we will, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Anybody want to make comments? I do. Well, there we go. Ms. Brunner. Thank you. Um, so two things that I wrote down. Thank you, everyone who... Um, had shared their their comp their public comment. So, two things I wrote down. Um, one, I didn't realize, and I want to clarify and ask, but to me, it didn't sound like a one-way vision. But that was brought up as a concern um, that our vision was a one-way plan. It, did I miss something? It, can someone answer that? Uh, no, it is not predetermined uh, one way uh, as far as uh, in the 50-year in the vision. Uh, that will be a part of the process discussing that idea as we go forward to the 50-year vision. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that <laughs> I didn't miss that. Um, and the, the, the focus group seems to be the, the topic of discussion tonight, and that was actually the first question I asked. Um, what is the Westcliff Focus Group? Because the first time I heard of it was tonight. And so um, I think, you know, what we're hearing, and I think it's important to recognize, is people, um, there's some concern, and um, people are very engaged and have worked um, really hard to stay abreast of all of these uh, update. So I really want to ask the, s the city staff and everybody working on this to, s to stay as transparent as possible in our processes and our updates and our information. And again, that website is really helpful. So, you know, if there is a focus group, um, to you know, explain what the focus group is and how it was so, came to be and what their role is and making it really clear that they're not an advisory body or this is what they will be inputting on and how is that different from the community meeting groups that was uh, shown on the slide in the uh, uh, timeline for the different community groups. And then we also had a question about are the community groups public? So I think that's another piece of information 
to really make clear for everybody, council members, members of the public, which meetings can can I attend? If someone's, not me, but um, if someone's reading the information, does that apply to me? Can I go to that? Like, where do I fit in, right? I, I think it's really important to have just that take a step back and think of it from a member of the public after hearing some of these comments, and I think that would be really uh, helpful. Um, so I assume that all those meetings are open to the public. Is that true? No. The community meetings? The community meetings have all been and will continue to be public meetings, and we will advertise those as much as possible on social media and our website and get those out through the other groups that we're working with related to Westcliff. And then we had a, a um, member of the public who asked about mail. Is there any way, I know that's postage is expensive, mm -hmm. but if they can get um, Iron Man notices, um, you know, if they're not on social media or don't know to go to the website. Definitely, totally agree. Smart, good evening. Yes, good evening. Erica Smart, <laughs> communications manager. Um, so we did actually on all the recent mailings that went out for construction, we included the links to our website as well as directions for signing up for our newsletter to really encourage people to get involved with the process if they haven't heard about what we're doing already. So mail, mail did go out. Correct. Correct. Um, can you explain where to the, to just um, a certain area or you can get back to if you don't know offhand, but. Uh, yes, I, I'm happy to answer that question. Yeah, mailers were sent out as a part of the infill wall uh, construction project. I believe the streets that were mailed out to were with regards to the uh, pilot one-way pilot area. So we were talking about Alta, Delaware, uh, and Columbia. Essentially, that 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 area was the impact area where we have the one-way pilot where the infill walls are being constructed. And so those were sent to about I think about 500 addresses in that in that area. And so Westcliff Drive residents didn't get that mail because that person said they were, lived on Westcliff Drive. Uh, I don't believe mailers were sent out for the entire length of Westcliff Drive. Okay, I I don't know what the process is for mail, but I I I would like to um, ask that you know that's considered going <clears throat> forward. Yeah, it's, I can just say for construction projects, typically it's um, within 300 feet of the proposed change or where the construction is happening. I believe that's what's in our immunity code as far as noticing. Um, but this is a much larger project when we think about the 50-year visioning, so maybe I'll let Erica jump in on this. Thank you. Yeah, we can absolutely consider doing some postcards to continue the outreach to make sure that everyone has access to the information that we have available on the website and get them signed up for our newsletter where we are doing those uh, bi-weekly updates, which include videos as well. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Contar Johnson. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I would like to just pick up on a couple of the questions that Ms. Robinson brought up during her public comments. Um, I think the question that was being asked was, are the focus groups open to the public? Not the community meetings, maybe both. So. Uh, and maybe we don't have the answer to that right now, but um, what's the format of the focus groups and are they open to the public? The focus groups were not intended to be open okay. to the public. Thank you for clarifying. And then the, a follow-up question is, um, are the city staff members members of the focus group or are they there as city staff? I mean, I know they're there as city staff, but is there a distinction there? When we looked up at the makeup of it, we had Nathan from Public Works and Tony Elliott from Parks and Rec, members of the actual focus group, due to how much content rich information the 50 year vision has in those respective departments. The other people like myself and Erica and Farrell on Strategies, we are just support staff, Tiffany Wise West, we are support staff helping facilitate the focus group, just like we do with the community meetings. We're there to move information and conversation along, but not participate necessarily. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Um, and then just a an ask that at our next communication around this, if we can spend a little bit of time further defining nature-based solutions and what that means, 
Um, and Silver Jackets was brought up by one, um, by Ms. Robinson's one group, but there's a number of those groups. Um, I know time is limited, but some way of communicating what, who those groups are, what they represent um, for the next time we come together. Is it all on our website? Comment on that? If I could just comment on that really yeah. quickly. So the scope of work for the work with the Silver Jackets is in, uh, and the partners that we'll be bringing in for that are, isn't fully defined right now. Okay. So we'll be bringing that back as an information item because that work doesn't formally start until January. Uh, so there's some more time to, to have conversations about those partnerships, mm -hmm. what they look like, and what the definitions are that are tied to that work. Excellent. Thank you. That's it. You know, that, I've been at this uh, for more than a minute. Um, and uh, one of the phenomenons that those of us who serve in local government or in public office, uh, at least my experience has been, you know, you'll have uh, some item, uh, we had an item a couple months ago, a few months ago, borrowing $127 million for our water department to do things with our wastewater system and all kinds of things. And I had like no comment, thing moves through, <laughs> it's all good. Then something comes along, it's like, $200,000, we'll spend eight hours on it, you know. So, I mean, there's a phenomenon here, and it exemplified itself here. We have this massive undertaking, and the vast bulk of our time tonight's on a focus group. So I think, although there's no motions here, I think you are getting the sentiment from both the council and the public, be very careful how that is constructed, who is on it, who has access to it, and what value you attribute to that when you bring its results forward, okay? Further questions or comments? Further business come before the council. Motion to adjourn to be in order. Uh, well, the vice mayor always makes it. <laughs> Ms. Brown, because she wants out of here quicker than anybody. Ms. Brown, who wants to get out of here, second passes. Non-debatable. Those in favor, signify by saying I oppose. Motion carries. So ordered. God love you all, and thank you for being here.